Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Enfield Town Council. Today is Monday, April 20th, 2015. Uh, before we get into our prayer and pledge, I have two proclamations to read. And uh, the first is on our Earth Day celebration, and the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas the town of Enfield will celebrate its sixth annual Earth Day at Freshwater Pond, rain or shine, on Wednesday, April 22nd, 2015. And whereas residents will be able to meet the New England Patriot mascot, Pat Patriot, that's a first. Listen to entertainment by Farmer Rick, participate in a perennial exchange, children's activities, face painting, and our annual tree planting. <clears throat> And whereas the global community now faces extraordinary challenges, such as global health issues, food and water shortages, and economic struggles. And whereas all people, regardless of race, gender, income, or geography, have a moral right to a healthy, sustainable environment with economic growth. And whereas it is understood that the citizens of the global community must step forward and take action to create a green economy to combat the aforementioned global challenges. And whereas a green economy can be achieved on the individual level through educational efforts, public policy, and consumer activism campaigns. And whereas it is necessary to broaden, broaden and diversify this global movement to achieve maximum success. And whereas Earth Day is the beginning of a new year for environmental stewardship commitments, and the implementation of sustainability efforts. Now, therefore, I, Scott Copen, Mayor of the Town of Enfield, on behalf of the Town Council, the Town Administration, and the entire community, hereby declares April 22nd, 2015, as Earth Day in the Town of Enfield, and ask all residents to support green economy initiatives, to commit to building a sustainable and green economy, and to encourage others to undertake similar actions. <coughs> signed today, April 20th, 2015, and we look forward to seeing folks down at our Earth Day celebration at Freshwater Pond uh, this coming Wednesday, April 22nd. And it runs from, Matt, time of Earth Day, 3, three to 6? 3 to 6. 3 to 6 p.m. at the pond, and we look forward to seeing you there. Then we have a proclamation designating April 2015 as Fair Housing Awareness Month. Whereas the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which included what is commonly referred to as the Fair Housing Act, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, was signed into law April 11, 1968, effectively prohibiting the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, family status, or handicap status. And whereas all Americans should be aware of their rights as set forth in the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And whereas shelter is a basic human need that if defined greatly, I'm sorry, if denied, greatly diminishes quality of life, making it essential to affirm the policy that housing in the town of Enfield shall be made available to all persons on the base of equality and fairness. <clears throat> and whereas in the 47 years since the passage of the Fair Housing Act, judicial and administrative enforcement, as well as public and private efforts to comply with the law, have reduced the barriers in obtaining the housing of one's choice. And whereas the town of Enfield recognizes the values and values the efforts of those who seek justice through the public and private enforcement of state and federal fair housing laws. Now, therefore, I, Scott Copen, Mayor of the Town of Enfield, on behalf of the Town Council, the Town Administration, and the entire community, to hereby proclaim April 2015 as Fair Housing Month and recognize the efforts of those that have worked to promote equal housing opportunities and to further the awareness of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, signed today, April 20th, 2015. Okay, so if we can pass those to Matt, that would be appreciated for our archives. And uh, I'm gonna ask uh, for the scouts from Troop 819, 
We've got Scout, Scout Masters Mike Ellis and Dave Cook here. And coming forward, we have Jason Lee, Michael Ellis, Austin Cook, Jack Wilcox, and Nick and Vinny, Vinny Hohen. Come forward, gentlemen. They're going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So come on up here. And as they make their way up, I will ask everyone in the audience to please stand for a prayer led by Jason. Deputy Mayor Bill Lee followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Come on up, guys. Right up here, face out to the audience. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing the council and the public and our guests here tonight. We ask that you um, bless them and give them safe passage home at the end of the evening. Grace the council in our deliberations and impart your wisdom and peace in each of our decisions. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Gentlemen. So turn and face the flag, right? Go ahead. Go ahead, start us off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Gentlemen, stay here for a second. <laughs> now, I'm going to call on Jason first. Come here, Jason. So um, what, what we give, the, first of all, we want to thank you for being here and leading uh, the council and our audience in the Pledge of Allegiance. What I want you to do is, Jason, you're going to take this microphone. You're going to turn and look at the, at the television, because that way the cameras can catch you face on. But we want you to tell us a little bit about each of you, who you are, um, what you like best about scouting doesn't have to be long, just a, a couple of words, okay, so that uh, we can be introduced to you and thank you for your service uh, to our town through scouting. Jason, you're first. Hello, I am Jason Lee, and my favorite thing about scouting is summer camp. Summer camp. I am, is this thing on? Yep. Yep. I'm Jack Wilcox, and my favorite thing about scouting personally is um, going camping. All right. I'm Austin Cook, and my favorite thing about sc scouting is um, bike riding, because I get to um, see places I've never been before. Awesome. My name, uh, my name's Vinny Holland, and I, uh, I like um, summer camp as well, and um, Boy Scouts. My name is Michael Ellis, and I like hiking. My name's Nick Cohen, and I like the adventure that Boy Scout brings. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thanks for all your work you do here in the town of Enfield. All okay, um, may we have roll call, please? Councillor Lee. Here. Councillor Mangini. Here. Councillor Stokes. Here. Councillor Suzak. Here. Councillor Arnone. Here. Councillor Bosco. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Denny. Here. Councillor Edgar. Here. Councillor Hall. Here. Mayor Copen. Here. We have 10 members present. One is absent. Okay, for our fire evacuation announcement, I remind our audience that in the event that the fire alarm sounds here at Town Hall, that we all must evacuate the building. Closest exit would be to the rear of Council Chambers and out to the front of Town Hall. If you choose to take the side door to your right or left, we then ask you to take the back set of stairs to the back parking lot of Town Hall. Minutes of the preceding meetings uh, is next, and we have four to adopt. The first is the special meeting of March 26, 2015. So moved. Second. Moved by <laughs> Councillor Arnone, seconded by Councillor, I heard, Sakala. <laughs> How's that? Sounds good. Exactly. Yeah. What you said. <laughs> Any discussion? Sensing none, show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. Special meeting March 30th, 2015. So moved. By Thank Councilor you. Mangini, seconded by Councilor Denny. Discussion? Sensing none, show of hands, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Special meeting April 6, 2015. So moved. Councillor Mangini, seconded by Councillor Arnone. Discussion? Sensing none, show of hands. All those in favor? 
Those opposed, any abstentions, unanimous. And finally, uh, the regular meeting from April 6, 2015. Second. By Councillor Denny. Second. Seconded by Councillor Mangini. Discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous as well. All right. Now we move to our special guest section. And I would like to call up Lorena Cisneros and the entire group from the Yukon People Empowering People program. So welcome. If uh, Lorena, do you need a, do you want to speak from the table or do you want to speak from up here? I can speak from there, yeah. Want, so c come on up. So. Yes, I can speak Whatever's easiest for you. Oh, actually, the lap, where would you like your class? Oh. They gotta be over here. So come over here. That's fine, we got the... And if one of you can give to the microphone. Just the screen here. And actually, if you could you open up okay. a little so that okay. Okay. can you all see yeah. the television? Yeah. 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 We're good. Can you? We're good. We're good. I will reposition myself to see. Bienvenido. <laughs> you like that? Hello. Hello. <laughs> no, Go ahead. Bienvenido a nuestra reunión. Welcome to our meeting. Oh, thank you. De nada. Bienvenidos, chicos. <laughs> well, I'm Lorena Cisneros. I'm the facilitator of the Yukon PEP program. And uh, I would like to, to let you know what is the PEP program means. So what is Yukon PEP? Yukon PEP uh, is a people empowering people program. It's a personal and family development program with a strong community focus. So this program provides training and support to target adult population resulting in change in their lives and in their community. So this time this program was in Spanish and uh, I have my two classes. Last year we have one, our first class, and this year is, is our second class. So what is the mission of the Yukon PEP is the people work together to make their community a better place for themselves and their children. Uh, the description of the program is that Yukon PEP uh, facilitator, it's me, provides 10 uh, two-hour sessions on the following topics. So it's value clarifications, communication skills, solve pro uh, problem solving, understanding the helping role, leadership skills, action planning, and community opportunities. So following uh, the formal training sessions, uh, the participation work in their, their project that benefit the community. The uh, Yukon PEP, our first uh, Yukon PEP class, uh, there are the people there. So the, the project was the community conversation. We have that last year. And uh, the themes we discussed was the ESL classes, uh, the help our kids with their school work and uh, helping with the translation in the schools for parents. So the result of this was that we, in summer 2014, it was an ESL class for parents. Also, adult education at a ESL level in their program. Uh, also, adult education has a new ESL writing class on Wednesday from 9 to 11. And there are four parents in, uh, in, in my first group that helps uh, with, uh, with other parents that they don't have the English as a second language in, in the schools. And uh, also, that is really good. We receive a grant called Infrastructure Grant from the uh, Grand Stain Memorial Fund, from which uh, we, this grant is like, uh, parents give uh, two teachers that were volunteers, uh, Kelly Warnock and Laura Gunes uh, Lunesky, 
they um, uh, teach uh, like uh, four parents how to do math and how to do how to read with the kids from K to to to. And uh, no, and our parents were Richard Galvez. Where's Richard? Richard, uh, Ana Troya, Claudia Viveros, and Lolita Cisneros. So when they were training, we translate a lot of material from schools. In this case, was the, the hand that the kids use for reading. And they also the, uh, how the kids have to retell the stories. So also we translate that. And uh, they, they, we have two workshops, so they are teaching math, how to do math. No, te vayas muy rápido. How to do math and uh, how to fast. read. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. And uh, how to read. It was a really good workshop because parents learned a lot, a lot, a lot from that. And especially in, in, in little things that we don't know, like... We don't have to use commas uh, or, or period. We have to switch that because we usually, in our countries, we use like that. Or also we make the seven with a little line in the middle. Here we don't have to do that. And the number one is just a line. We have to make like that. So things, small things that change because in the schools, teachers see all of those things. And uh, we have a family day too. It was really good because the kids were with parents and we play a lot and the kids, the kids asking for another one of those, like, oh my goodness, they love it. And we're gonna have a, a visit to the library on May 15 with all the parents and kids. And in the library, they are waiting for us because they're gonna teach us how to get cards, how to find books. And also we get uh, from this grant, we get uh, a lot of books in Spanish and now schools have in the library. And this is my second class. That is my second class. They are playing in how to communicate and how to listen better. So that is a game that I make with them. And we receive a guest from a Waterbury is a, a nonprofit organization. The, uh, the name is Madre Latina. They help moms and uh, with all the situation, and they are really good and they give a lot of ideas to the group. And statistics that I have is uh, Latinos right now in the uh, fiscal year 15, we are the 12% in the schools. Uh, out of that 12%, the K to 2, we have the 28%, that is where we are focused. And uh, in the 3 to 5, we have the 23%, and uh, so on. In uh, two years ago, Latinos in the schools were like 515. Right now, we have 604. But also, we have to incentive uh, all the parents that when they have roots, Latino roots, we are incentives to the, in the application, they have to put it like we are Latinos because the statistics are gonna change. Finally, I could say that what we want is like, we just want to a uh, better future for our kids and we want to teach them the, the good way to help others. So I always close my speeches with this quote that I use since I helping my people. As you grow older, you will discover that you have two hands, one for helping yourself, the other for helping others. So that's my people. Awesome. <laughs> I have parents that want to talk. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, good evening. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Rich Galvez. I just want to thank you all, first of all, for having us here. Uh, second of all, what the PEP program has done for me, actually, it's given me an insight on the Latin community in Enfield, which when I first moved here, I didn't know there was one, I'll be honest with you. And the more time I spent with the group in general, I see how it's growing. And it has, for me, it has opened my eyes not only to help the Latin community, but also to get involved in Enfield in general, 
you know, because right now, presently, I'm in the PLA program also. So I want to be able to help out and fill out also. And in general, for me, what I want out of the PEP and everything is for Enfield, instead of being two separate communities, the Latin community and the American community, to all mesh as one and be able to, you know, help each other out. But for the time being, I mean, I think the PEP program is doing an outstanding job actually helping the, the Spanish community, like some of the parents who don't speak English and stuff like that, and are kind of lost when it comes to the education system in general here in Enfield, to be able to help them understand and communicate with the teachers and, you know, with, with the board council, you know, with everything. So that's what PEP's doing for me. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, good night. Um, I'm Ana Troya. Uh, I'm a president from Enfield. And what the PEP is for me is the link. It's actually the link that connects me with our community. Because of uh, the PEP program, I hear about more of the town services and more of the town events. And we, as a community, also are coming together. That's what the PEP doing, is doing for us. We're meeting more Hispanic people in Enfield. And we, I think our purpose is to become a larger group and get more involved in our community and help, help each other uh, on the community of Enfield. So thank you. Great. I would like, last thing, I would like to invite you. Uh, my second group are going to have uh, their project, and their project is a Latin dance in Enfield. So they're going to dance, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and also, they're going to be with some parents and, and teach uh, Latino dance uh, ah, moves. Yeah. So, special groups. We're going to have this in uh, May 1st at five in uh, Alcorn School in the gym. I'm gonna pass the, the flyer. And also we're gonna have a community, another community conversation with both groups. And uh, this is gonna be on May 21st from five to 7.45 in uh, Angela La Magna Center. And any questions? Yes. <laughs> questions for the group. Questions, comments. Yeah. Go ahead, Cindy. Muchas gracias. De nada. <laughs> it's a great program. Uh, Sorry. Um, you know, uh, obviously to bring people together and also to help our children mm -hmm. get over that barrier. <clears throat> you know, with language skills and math. And I commend you for all your hard work. It's wonderful to oh, see this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, I've, I've had the pleasure of being at the community conversation last year, too, which was oh, a, yes. <laughs> a real a great event. And I, you know, really think everyone uh, that can get out, come out and, uh, and say hello and meet the community. And thank you for being wanting to be such a part of the community. I know there's some issues with uh, school translators and, and you're yes. very eager to learn, um, learn English. And we need to also make sure we support those programs um, that you can uh, have uh, you know, in the school system so you can learn uh, the English so you can communicate with the teachers and, oh, yes. and have a, a better, uh, um, better yes, education for yeah, your children. We're working so hard to have parents that we don't want to, we don't like the line phone that they translate because it's not like more personal. So the parents like to be with somebody to translate that. So... So, do, and uh, volunteers also for that too oh, through yes. the school we, system. I have, if, if I have a lot of parents that are volunteers for that. As they learn the, uh, more, they can also yes. volunteer back into the community and, oh, get, yes. and get help out people that are just coming in. Yes. Yeah. Great, great job. Thank you. Looking forward to the uh, the dance. Oh yes, and tomorrow. No, when is the the planned day? They heard. we're gonna be there with uh, or, 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 or the early day. We're gonna be there. Yeah. The per perennial, perennial yeah. plan, yeah. We're awesome. Be there. Wednesday. Yes. Ed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're doing a great job. Uh, Alcorn, what was the time on Alcorn on May 1st? 5 p.m. May 5 p.m. 5. 5. Yes. And the community conversation? May 21st. Uh, I have that. And the time? From 5, uh, I have the. Uh, from 5 to 7.45. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Cindy. Yeah, thank you. 
Just, just one final question. Yes. Um, with regards to the, uh, the, the dancing, salsa, merengue. Salsa, merengue. Whole We're going to have, okay, let me explain. <laughs> Mexico, the people from Mexico, raise your hand. They're going to do the quebradita. quebradita. Uh, Colombia, they're going to do merengue. All right. Uh, from Brazil, she's going to make the samba. The salsa. Samba. Samba. Uh, Peru. Salsa. <laughs> Ecuador, we're going to mix. Gonna mix. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, my final um, question, when you are looking for volunteers, do you accept um, people that um, are, are bilingual that speak Spanish and English? Do, yes. do you welcome? Oh, yes. We welcome everybody. This type of volunteer that can can help with the English yes. um, translation. We we. you we well, also, I just, I, yeah. You want to give her a contact number? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah I, I think it's a great program, especially for our community. We want to help the community, and I hear that kids from high school, uh, they want to just practice the, the, the Spanish. So we want to help them to just talk in Spanish with them because they know the rules, how to read, how to write yes. Spanish, but they want to practice. Conversational. So, yes, yeah. yeah, so we want to help them. I was like looking how to contact these kids and help them. That is another way to. Excellent. Mm -hmm. It's muy importante. Sí. Oh, sí. <laughs> Any further questions or comments? So thank you so much for coming here. Thank Keep up the great work. Love seeing how this program has developed oh, over a couple definitely. Of years. So. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well Thank done. You. We'll see you at Earth Day, dancing, community Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs>
we've had many successes in the last year, and I think one of the largest, last year when we applied for our funding, um, we were awarded $50,000 for our community. We are also given an extra opportunity um, to get an infrastructure grant. So we applied for and were granted this infrastructure grant that Lorena just spoke to you about. Um, the Spanish PEP program has been amazing. The parent engagement piece that she has done um, and the programs that, that they have done with that um, grant as well as the PEP program has been unbelievable. It was really great to see them here tonight um, in their um, blue shirts. They are definitely growing in number. So um, she has done a fantastic job and we are so lucky to have her. Um, many people look um, to Lorena for help with um, um, translation in the schools and I think it's made a huge impact. Um, some of the other successes that we have had um, in the last year, um, we've done a lot of work in our uh, three to three, that's um, age three to grade three. We were part of a statewide um, institute. We had a team there. Um, and we've just, you know, there's just been so many um, programs going on in all three areas of focus that we have in our plan. So it's family engagement, early care and education and health. And I think one of the most exciting things that's coming up in the year ahead um, is we will be part of the new Stowe Early Learning Center. Um, Kite now has an office there. Um, so, you know, that is really something great. Um, our first readers, they have over 1,700 first readers certified. Um, if you've ever been to a first reader ceremony, it's nothing like you've seen before. Um, so excited. Uh, last September we had um, uh, Dr. Myra Jones-Taylor, uh, Commissioner of the Office of Early Childhood, um, speak at our annual meeting, and she asked to come and be part of the first reader ceremony. And um, she did such a fantastic job. So there's just a little bit of um, information as to where we've been and where we're going, and um, we'd love to have you participate in our focus group. I'll be sure to send out more information. I don't know if there's any questions. Questions for for Chris, and but we also want to get a consensus that it's okay for for me to sign the grant. Um, so, Greg, uh, just great work, you guys. I mean, I've been part of you in different fashions over the last uh, ten years or so, and great work. And I appreciate the grants you get and everything else. But I think uh, you're one of the organizations that uh, have proven to be uh, vital to. Uh, to what we do here in education and everything. So I just want to thank you, and I'm all in favor, obviously, of uh, renewing the grant and supporting you guys, so. Thank you. Cindy? <clears throat> thank you. Just to echo my colleague, um, Councilman Stokes, you've done a phenomenal job with the KITE program, and we're really very fortunate. I've seen the uh, tremendous results, the outcome that we have, and the, the products of our children. It's just amazing, so most definitely, we need to go forward with this. Thank and you. thank you for your hard work. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, nod of heads, consensus to sign the grant? Mm -hmm. So if you have the paperwork, I'll take it, or we'll hook up? I can give it to you if you... Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll sign it quick so the work gets done. So thank you, Chris. We're going to create a contract. Yeah, right here. Does anybody else have a contract? I'd like to have the mayor sign right now. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you? <laughs> yeah, I know. Or 2015. Okay, you're official. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Great job. <clears throat> we can give her a, a clap. Okay, um, the next item on our agenda is public communications and petitions. If there's anyone in the audience wishing to address the council, and you'll be first, come on up. Come on up to the, to the center table. Please state your name and address for the record. Please keep your comments to no more than five minutes. Um, I do time you, so if you hit the, fourth, the 430 mark, I politely interrupt you. It won't be that long. And, uh, <laughs> and we ask that you refrain from the use of personalities, meaning don't call us names. <laughs> OK? Welcome. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Carmela Stauffer. This is my son, Stephen Stauffer. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Enfield and have lived on seven Birchwood Terrace for 38 years. I want to thank you for your attention on this matter. Um, I'm here to submit a petition, and I have it here, and photos of, um, I'm here to submit this, you know, okay. 
on the behalf of the residents of Birchwood Terrace and Road. The petition is for the road and sidewalk replacement. It has come to my, our attention that we are not scheduled until 2019. All residents thought these two streets and sidewalks were going to be done this year. We voted this in and we will be paying taxes for this road referendum. Many elderly residents and taxpayers on these two streets have been here for 50 years and said these streets have never been repaired or repaved. They have been repaired maybe, but not repaved. Um, and I've been there for 38 years and they've never been done. Uh, many walk themselves and their dogs. Parents walk their babies in carriages and have to walk in road because the sidewalks are bad. We request the sidewalks on Washington Road between Hemlock and Bertrand also be replaced. Our grandchildren, our children and grandchildren play and ride their bikes in the street. Um, Birchwood Terrace is a cul-de-sac, so they play and learn to ride their bikes in the street. And they play basketball and everything else in the street. And some have fallen because of the, the, the conditions of the street. Um, it was brought to my attention about nine years ago, Hemlock Drive was, was in our neighborhood and attached to Birchwood Road, was done because a woman had fallen and hit her head. Um, that street and side was done and stopped at the end of Birchwood Road and, and Washington. Uh, this has caused many issues to the end of Birchwood Road because Hemlock is higher and water runs down in front of houses and uh, the sewer overflows and they sink. Um, will it take someone else or a child falling to get hurt to get our streets and sidewalks done? I live at the end of Birchwood Terrace, which is a cul-de-sac. Um, the snow is always pushed in front of my house, and I've, that's, I, I, that's where it has to go. But the curbs have always been um, broken, and they've been replaced. But what's different this year is I have no curb, and my, my husband and myself have to clean up the yard because the chunks of road and gravel uh, are on my uh, yard because the road is deteriorating so much. What is concerning to all the residents, aside from the safety of ourselves and children, is what condition are these roads and sideways are going to be in 2019? That is four years from now, if they are so bad right now, especially after the, the winter we had <laughs> and have been experiencing for the past few years. I would like to thank you and the town officials moving up these streets and sidewalk replacement before 2019. Again, that is four years from now. Sooner would be preferable and greatly appreciated. This year would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you again for all your time and support. Your tax, your, these, your taxpayers, your voters, and longtime residents of Enfield. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it looks like they have the whole street that's signed. So. Yes, the street. All right, thank you very much. Public communications. Yes, come on up. Good evening, everyone. I'm Maureen Mullen, 1625 King Street. I first of all wanted to check to see if in your package you got a letter from me inviting you to come to see the site next to the correct school. There is a hearing that's going to be coming up soon, and I just thought I should invite I the commissions and the mayor and town council to I don't come. think we got the letter, no. but we'll... Um, I know we didn't we didn't get an information packet this Friday, so we got the link to the agenda, but it might oh. be part of that. So, okay, I brought it in last Tuesday because okay. I wanted to make sure, and I thought you know if I come, then you'll know you really are invited. And I don't think I put my telephone number in the letter, so I have this for you, and then other members who want to get it from you, that's fine. I just ask that you call ahead. Okay. so that I'm there and I can show you, just in case you have any questions. We'll have you give that on. to Matt, and we'll make sure that 
the letter is found and gets out to everyone via email tomorrow. Okay. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I just thought if you see for yourself how things are at this point, if there are any questions anyone has, right. at least you'll be aware. I wasn't even thinking about talking about roads, but I'm going to add Mullen Road <laughs> to the list for obvious reasons, which anyone can see if they go on it. I do have to say it's only been paved since I was a youngster as far as beyond over the hill all the way out. I remember my mother pushing the baby carriage with my sister and me walking along. <laughs> so it's only been paid for a few years now. And there was a third thing. Um, I have to call the lighting department because they were wonderful. They had a new street light put in around Thanksgiving time. It's going out already. I don't understand. Hmm. But I'll be checking with them. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Welcome. Public communications. Anyone else? Thank you very much. So we'll move to counselor communications. Tom. Matt, on, on the Birchwood, um, I had sent you an email uh, a little while ago explaining that some, uh, actually the first time this was out, it seemed to be that it was on the top of the list. Could you explain um, how that works so we can at least clear that out? So I don't, I, I was going to try to explain it, but I dare not. And um, uh, again, Birchwood Terrace is one of the streets that really doesn't get a lot of traffic. So it falls under that, the way we've, uh, um, the way we rate the streets for their importance is how much traffic and and this is one that kind of falls under the radar that doesn't get a lot of traffic, but it's a mess. And it does get a lot of people traffic, though. So the residents really uh, if you live on a cul-de-sac uh, uh, society, so to speak. They're a very, very tight uh, group of people that always out on the street. I, I know my, my wife grew up on this road. So my father-in-law has owned this house since it was built and, uh, and paid taxes all these years. And the, and the road is just slowly slowly getting you know uh to j just to a place where it's almost dirt in some places so um those are those are the, the ones sometimes we have to reconsider because of the way they're uh because of the traffic on them they, they don't necessarily have a lot of traffic but um they do have a lot of use and uh that's it thanks thank you tom cindy thank you <clears throat> um it's not often that we're able to congratulate and recognize one of our own colleagues up here, but I'm going to tonight. Um, one of our, our members up here is a Rotarian along with Mr. Stokes and myself. One of our um, highest esteemed awards in Rotary is the Paul Harris Award. And um, one of our um, highest um, beliefs in Rotary is self above others, <clears throat> which means that you do work to promote others always that's the goal that's the intent and we do a lot of fundraising we do a lot of um, benefits uh, <clears throat> every year two to three uh, recipients of the Paul Harris Award are are known and celebrated on June in June this year it's June 12th our very own Mayor Scott Copen is one of our recipients this year and I just think it's appropriate to let the town know that um, Scott has uh, received this um, prestigious award and we're honored that he um, has served the community and the capacity that Rotary has acknowledged. So congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. That's it? That was it. All right. Counselor Communications, anyone? Bill. First of all, we do have a a resolution here in a moment, but I, I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, the efforts of the, the Picture Enfield group, which held um, their first in what they hope, and I think what uh, many of us hope is a uh, ongoing series of uh, photography uh, exhibits here in town. Um, the, if you did not have the pleasure of, of uh, seeing the event uh, two Fridays ago at the um, Enfield Senior Center, it, it was an extremely well attended, um, authentic, artistic display and um, and community event. I mean, they had several hundred people come through the doors 
um, by the time it was over that night. Um, they raised a lot of money for the uh, Friends of the Enfield Senior Center, which was kind of a, a byproduct of the effort. I think more than anything, they were able to um, showcase a tremendous amount of talent and um, showed uh, everyone there that, you know, in, in little instance of what we all see and experience every day around town is a lot of uh, artistic um, beauty. And um, so we want to, I want to thank them for that effort. And the, the Enfield Cultural Arts Commission was one of several sponsors. So it is an endeavor that uh, we're hoping to, to grow and, and uh, get more folks involved with. Um, Second of all, and while we're throwing roads out here, I, I know this was something that the council had discussed, uh, Scott, through you to Matt. We had discussed it at length in last year's budget cycle, and we held off on additional improvements to North Street. Um, now that it's spring and people, uh, residents in particular of North Street, are seeing the activity start to gin up around town, I've been asked what the status is of that road, and you know, we were under the impression that there was some design work that had to go into drainage out there before it could be prioritized as an improvement. I'm hoping that's going on and that we can revisit this um, in the budget cycle. So, Matt, I, I can follow up with you to see where we are on that. Um, lastly, I will um, take up our motion, and uh, Scott would like to make a motion to suspend the rules and move the following items to miscellaneous this evening and proceed to a vote. The items are E, F, G, H, J, and K. Second. Okay, motion by Deputy Mayor Lee, seconded by Councillor Hall. Discussion to move those items to miscellaneous. Sensing none by show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. I'll set. Anything else? Nope, that'll do it. Carol? Through Scott to Matt, it, it's probably more a question for Kevin. Um, I know he's in a meeting for ethics right now. Is he coming back yes. later? Okay. Um, I'll give you the questions. Um, you might be able to answer one of them, Matt. It's regarding the, um, the tree cutting again. Um, and I meant to ask it at the last meeting. The stumps that the tree companies are leaving behind um, is there a state regulation about requiring them to remove the stumps as well? Um, is, it, is it according to what the local zoning requirements are, or would that come under CLMP's uh, contract? So that's my question. Um, and then an update on the uh, correct school. We haven't had one in a while. Um, maybe he can give us dates and if there's anything that's coming up on the uh, the judicial calendar for that would be nice to have an update on that and then on you you told us to get back to you on wood that they're leaving on the side of the road they go from uh, Collins's intersection of uh, Powder Hollow Road uh, left onto Abbey all the way up Abbey Road there's a ton of wood left on on a uh, couple vacant properties and uh, some properties that only abut Abbey. So if they shoot left, they'll, they'll see it. And um, also going to pot filling, that direction uh, for the uh, potholes that are really bad that they never got to um, with the gravel fill. So that's it for me. Thanks, Carol. Joey? Yeah, through the um, mayor to town manager, uh, can we send someone out to Roseanne Street to get some potholes fixed? Uh, they thought we were going to get them done, but we need them done. And uh, with Carol, they still haven't picked the logs up across the street from my house and the ones up on the hill that uh, they cut down. That's it. Thanks, Joey. Ed? Yeah, are we going to uh, go back, I guess, town manager or public works? Are, are we going back and uh, this year to fix manholes and raise them back up? Because that seems to be a big issue. I know we have a pothole issues, but uh, and a lot of them. Because I've been getting those calls uh, 
pretty much from the winter, but uh, the manholes on uh, Brainerd Road, uh, still mo um, Middle Road, South Road, all of those streets that were done, and it seems like, you know, I, I see cars in front of me dodging them. They're playing dodge cars. Uh, are we going back to to repair some of those or bre or raise them up? <clears throat> and uh, don't forget uh, Edmonds, Stephen, and Cheryl. Cheryl. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone else? I've, I've got a couple, couple items. Um, First of all, um, we are um, appointing a, um, a joint committee with the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, to review regulations both on the town side and on zoning side uh, over the food truck issue. Um, Chairman Duran of the Planning and Zoning Commission has appointed uh, himself, Charlie Duran, Lori Longy, and Al Drynan. Uh, to serve uh, three members from PNZ, three members from the town council, uh, two of the three from the council, um, Councillor Hall, myself, and in conversations with Red uh, for a Democrat representative. And uh, so once we get... Just real quick, um, <clears throat> Commissioner Drynan wouldn't be able to make it, so they're going to be putting Commissioner Falk on that. Okay. All right. Thank you for that update. And um, so we'll keep, keep everyone apprised under the uh, reports of special committees of the council. Um, I think everyone received this letter. Um, Caitlin Connery, um, who had written to us, she's 12 years old, lives in Enfield, attends JFK. All right, then let me read it. Um, my name is Caitlin Connery. I am 12 years old. I live in Enfield and attend John F. Kennedy Middle School. I volunteer at Enfield Loaves and Fishes Soup Kitchen and know that Enfield does a lot for the less fortunate, but until recently I didn't realize we don't have a homeless shelter here in Enfield. During Christmas break, when I was out shopping with my mom and one of my sisters, I saw a homeless man and his two dogs. We brought him a warm meal and food for the dogs. While it made me feel good helping him, it broke my heart knowing that he had nowhere to sleep or go to or go to to get out of the cold. I think that Enfield is a big enough town with other people who may also need a place to stay that we should have a homeless shelter. One idea that was brought to my attention by my sister's friend was using homes or buildings that have been foreclosed. With this idea, Enfield can fix up an old building or house that just sits run down and abandoned and give it a purpose. Please consider this idea to both improve the town and be able to provide a warm place for people who are homeless. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And it's signed, Caitlin Connery. Um, just wanted to thank Caitlin at, at 12 years old to take the time to sit down and write. It, it was addressed to the town of Enfield, so I thought everyone received it. I'll give it to Matt. It's got my notes on the back, but you can, uh, get it out to the entire council and uh, we can consider that as we move forward. Um, we talked earlier about Earth Day as Wednesday, April 22nd from 3 to 6 uh, down at Freshwater Pond. So it's the second year at the pond. Um, last year was a great event and uh, we already know Pep is going to be out there as well. And um, so uh, a good a good day. It's a little cooler. Would have been nice if it was Saturday, right? Yeah. But but we'll be there. Um, another great event, uh, Clean Sweep, is this coming Saturday, April 25th, 10:30. And volunteers that want to participate in the Clean Sweep event uh, are to meet here at Town Hall at 10:30, and they promise uh, two hours. And I believe you get a T-shirt, T-shirt, and two hours. Um, and another event is, um, to me, it's the official start of spring in Enfield, but it got moved to May 2nd. But that's the Scanic Spring Splash, Saturday, May 2nd. Uh, it's the 24th annual canoe and kayak race down the Scantic in Hazardville. There are novice racers who uh, take a two and a half mile course, 
but it doesn't come all the way down to the powder mill barn and, and the bridge at, at South Maple Street. The intermediate to expert racing classes, it's a five mile race. And that race begins at 12 o'clock. And according to the organizers, the first racers take about 40 minutes to uh, do the five miles. So if you wanna come watch from the bridge, 1230, 20 of one, you should start to see the first racers come. The street gets closed down, so it's great viewing. Uh, depending on, on the weather and the, the banks of the river it are also great spots to, um, to, see, the, uh, to see the race. Following the race, um, there's a, a award ceremony in, in the Powder Mill Barn. Uh, the race benefits the Enfield Food Shelf. Parking is tight down at the, uh, at the start or at the end of the race where the award ceremony is so they have a shuttle bus from Fermi High School uh, down to the uh, to the powder mill barn and the bridge. More information, go to scanicspringsplash.org, um, and they're looking for for racers. So you need a helmet. You have to be 16. If you are 16 and under, you need um, a parent to sign for you, I believe. Um, so it's a great race. Come out, come on out and support uh, the Scanic Spring Splash. And then my my final comment is, um, it's, it's a road one, Summers Road. So I know we had a lot of uh, pothole issues where uh, Summers Road it becomes Summers Road when you cross over from Summers to Enfield, and it's a minefield. Yeah. Um, and, and the question is, can we find out if Summers Road is on our road replacement program. If it's not, what are our short term or immediate term and, and longer term of how we're gonna address that road? I, I know there was a lot of damage to cars on, on Summers Road this year, um, crossing in. So that would be appreciated. Um, so I can get back to a resident, but I think everyone wants a, an update there. Um, that's it. Anyone else? Red. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I'd just like to answer your what you had to say on the food trucks. At our caucus, we felt that it should be enti the entire council and the entire PNZ discussing this matter. And we had a question as to whether the council should be involved in PNZ business. However, if you need a name for the co committee, it will be mine. Okay. And, and for that, Red, and thank you for volunteering, um, what will happen is the town council is responsible to approve regulations to oversee the movement of food trucks on town roads, parking in public rights of way, and parking lots, public parking lots. And uh, so we can have the two groups work together and they're gonna have to bring, bring these proposals back to the respective bodies for, for the approvals. So it's just the working group to, to get drafting some regulations for council approval for the town side and PNZ approval for the zoning side. Right, well I can understand that we would draft regulations for the council side, but I don't think we should be involved in regulations for PNZ. Okay. Thanks for agreeing to serve on the committee. Anyone else? Okay. Next item, town manager's report and communications. Matt. Good evening. Have a long list tonight. Sorry. Uh, so first, uh, let's get some of the easy things out of the way. Uh, on your desk, I place the uh, monthly update uh, dashboard for workers comp. We have uh, three more months to go, and that's where we stand. Right now, everything is going pretty good in terms of uh, the use of the funds, so uh, let's hope that that keeps up for the last three months. Thank you. Uh, answering part of the question that uh, Councillor Hall brought up, uh, and, and just to let you know about this, I have a call in to uh, Eversource's uh, representative and she did call back today and I didn't have a chance to get back to her, so I haven't had a conversation yet. But, um, and I wanted to go over a full range of issues with her to make sure that she understands where we're coming from with this. 
But uh, the piece about the um, the uh, stumps, I believe that they will be coming back to grind those out. Uh, generally, they're supposed to do that. When they remove a tree, they're supposed to remove the whole tree. Supposed to. Because there's a, a gazillion stumps all over that they haven't even started. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's going to be huge if that's the case. Yeah, they, and they, they typically contract that out to a third party as well. So, I mean, and again, so I what's coming. don't, well, I, I like to say that is the case. Okay. I believe that to be the case, but I will verify we'll it once I speak with uh, the representative. Okay, yeah. thanks. And I don't think, other than other than state road projects, so when they're, you know, doing, uh, you know, contractors are doing the work on behalf of the state of Connecticut, then there would be regulations from the state. But I, I don't believe that utilities, when they're doing their projects, have, have any particular state regulation. I mean, there are some, like, in terms of notification, but I don't know if it's, they have to take out the, the stumps or not. So, I mean... We'll look into that and have a full report as soon as I am able to speak with the uh, representative. Okay, especially I would think in our right-of-ways too. I don't, I don't see why that would be an issue for us to request that those all be removed because a lot of them are in our right-of-ways. Right, and, and typically if we're taking a tree down, we take it all the way down to, to ground level. Okay. So okay. I, I'm assuming that's the case, but let me verify it and, and make sure that before I speak any more, I'm right. accurate. And when you're asking them, can you ask them if, uh, when they take the stump down, if there's plans to bring something in to seed over it, or if they're, because the cleanup for what they've done so far has been a mess. So, you know, it'd be interesting to find out what the finished product's supposed to look like from them. So, thank you. And Bill has a question on, on that, right? You yeah, could you, could, you, could you get, could you ask the representative for a copy of the agreement that they're providing to a, a homeowner to sign? Well, it's just, it, it, yeah, it's not so much an agreement as it is a notice and then signing off that they received it. Okay. And we'll allow it. Just get a yeah, copy. No, yeah, yeah, no, I just, I, I didn't want you to think that it's some elaborate, like, six pages. It's oh, even better. Like one yeah. page. Okay. So, okay. Yep. I, that was part of what I was going to ask for. All set. I am. Okay, Matt. <laughs> Next, uh, the uh, Edmund Stevens, uh, Cheryl. Uh, staff and I have been meeting with uh, the uh, a resident that came in to speak to council. <clears throat> and uh, actually prepared uh, a couple different alternatives, which I have somewhere here. So it, it comes down to three, three alternatives for taking care of those issues. The first, of course, is a, a total reconstruction of the three roads. <laughs> and uh, the working estimate we have for that is $575,000. Uh, a second option was a partial reconstruction and it's basically looking at uh, Stephen and Edmund and where they connect so going around the corner there if you're familiar at all with it um, totally reconstructing those areas that will take care of some of the worst spots in the road but it also regrade the road so the drainage will work because the biggest the biggest issue they have out there is it's very flat and so there's no drainage whatsoever, and we have to get pitched to the road to be able to get it to uh, drain in. The uh, third option, which is probably one that uh, can be done right away, is uh, installing a number of dry wells in the area, in that area that I just talked about, we looked at, would look at totally reconstructing, um, but strategically placed, I think it was three or four um, dry wells and do a little bit of work around uh, the dry wells asphalt-wise to make sure the water gets funneled into it. That's about a $17,000 uh, operation to get it done. Now, these roads are not on the roads 2015. Uh, so what we have at our disposal is we could start budgeting. You know, obviously, as part of the budget process, you could budget money for that or start setting money aside from that. Uh, for either the partial reconstruction or the total reconstruction. There is money set aside in our drainage accounts that would be able to absorb the installation of the dry wells. In, in talking with the resident, actually this morning uh, we had another meeting, um, he, was, he was okay with taking a short-term approach 
and um, putting those dry wells in. Uh, not okay with waiting to do a total reconstruction, um, but but I think that's something that we could do in the short term. It will ease some of the issues. Obviously, it's not going to correct the road issues, but it will create um, and correct some of the drainage issues we have there. So I don't know if, if that's okay, we can start the process because it's over the 15,000, so we'll have to put a bid together for that. And so we're looking probably during the summer months to actually do that. And that's taking the money out of the drainage capital account? Correct. Uh, consensus for that? Nods of heads? Okay. Okay. Blowing through my list here. Now I'm going to invite up our special guests. You've read about them. You've heard about them. It's the people from Public Works. They have a lot of reports. Come on up. They have a lot of good information for tonight. You can tell by the smiles on their face. Yeah. Looks like Jonathan was out repairing potholes and injured his hand. <laughs> So why don't we start? Why don't we start with the the bigger <laughs> topics, and why don't we bite off Mullen Road? <sighs> yeah, I was prepared to start somewhere else, but <laughs> um, that's okay. Um, well, we've looked at a number of different alternatives for uh, trying to do something with Mullen Road, understanding that. It's scheduled for total reconstruction um, in two years. And it also is scheduled to have five culverts improved and the road widened in those areas this summer. So we started off with, uh, well, an understanding that the road uh, probably grew up from an old farm road and was never uh, given a proper base, but uh, so it's it's difficult to do much out there that's going to uh, improve the situation without spending a lot of money. So we we basically looked at three alternatives. The cheapest one um, we uh, broached at the DPW subcommittee meeting last Tuesday. Well, last week sometime. Yeah. I lose track of time, but last Tuesday, and uh, it wasn't too well received. <laughs> uh, I think the feeling was that it would not last, and um, I have to agree with that. Anyway, the, the idea was to find the worst spots, which we've already identified, uh, saw cut them neatly, um, and then just uh, Put some millings that we have stockpiled at the at the transfer station, the former landfill, into the holes and bring them up to grade, and then pave it with either an inch or, inch or two inches of, of asphalt. And the cost of that was somewhere around twenty thousand dollars. It was also suggested to us that um, possibly uh, reclaiming the pavement might be uh, might be uh, an alternative, and that um, if we were to do that, you you really need to just reclaim the whole road, or at least uh, I think from Route Five back to uh, the driveway for the um, mulch operation because that's where the bulk of the truck traffic is um, we hate to we hate to do something like that without doing more investigation because as I said I suspect that there's nothing under this pavement that's worth reclaiming and that would provide a decent base for the road um, but we estimated to do that and then pave it, we'd be in the order of a quarter million dollars. The third alternative, uh, one we looked at most recently, 
um, is somewhere in between in cost. It, uh, we went out and measured the worst areas. We got about um, 10,000, I'm, I'm sorry, 30,000 square feet that we'd propose to excavate to a depth of about 15 inches and put in um, um, gravel or, or stone, processed stone for 11 inches and then finally pave over the areas with uh, four inches of uh, bituminous concrete. And the estimate for that's about $115,000. You're looking for feedback. <coughs> Joey. <coughs> well, okay. <laughs> okay. One second, one second. Yeah, I forgot. Right. Uh, Jonathan just reminded me. I forgot that um, uh, one of the questions you're, <laughs> you're going to have is how quickly could any of these be done? And the one that I just explained for about $115,000, the items um, that are required, the operations that are required to do that, are some of them are on our on-call utility contracts so we have uh, contractors on call that could do part of the work and then the paving itself could possibly be accomplished under the state bid for the vendor in place um, contract um, we can't really give you a good timetable for that because we're not sure how the contractors will respond I mean they're we have an on-call bid. We don't know what their schedules are. We don't know if they're even willing to do the work, but we could, we would contact uh, them to find out. The uh, paving is a little, could be even more of a problem. The state contractors are under no obligation to work for us if they, if they're busy, if they have a lot of work, and the nature of this, where they would be paving little patches, moving all around is not something they normally like to do under this contract because it's time consuming and expensive. But um, we would check with them in the next week or so if that's how it was decided we should proceed. And then finally, if, if it didn't work with the on-call contractor and the state contractor, we'd put it out to bid. And that would probably take us a minimum of a couple of months to uh, to get bids. Well, like I says, how how much of that really damaged area was in the areas that we're going to work on? I, I know I asked to have you mark it off so we could see how you know where where our scope of work was going to be on that <coughs> road anyway. And and the next thing is, as we all know, who use millings. Unless you have a base under the millings, you're better off putting process there and then paving over it because millings don't hold up. They actually blow out faster than than uh, a, 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 a gravel well or a, a process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I'm worried about is we're going to put the millings in there and they're going to blow right out. And, and what I brought up at the DPW committee was they're scheduling this for 2015. But as we can see, all of our... Our uh, times have never been really truly accurate. So what if this thing goes another three years? You know, they're going to have to do land takings. They're going to have it's it's a pretty um, intensive road to do. So you know, I'm more worried about the longer run and if they don't get to it. And again, millings really just don't work for to use them for base. Okay, a couple right. things. Uh, the question you asked, we did uh, remove the areas uh, that are in the, that are within the um, work areas for the culvert job. We did remove those when we made these estimates. So. Okay. Now the next thing was when I was talking, we we don't need to pave the whole road, and well, maybe we do, because I I couldn't see what we got. But can we just cut? The areas out are bad. I mean, what I'm what I'm worried about is there's so many patches and so many layers there that they're starting to, to come apart. Mm -hmm. And if we put a new uh, thing of asphalt on top of something that's loose under there, 
it's not going to last till next year, and we're going to be doing this. We're just go throw money in it for nothing. I mean, and and that road is really bad. I mean, it's it's terrible, and I would really hate to see someone get hurt on that road because it is traveled quite a bit. You know, we were down to the part was talking to Bill that we should actually probably put some signs limiting our liability on that road, not to use it. I mean, it's it's pretty bad. Counselor, I, I apologize if I wasn't clear earlier. The um, the hundred fifteen thousand dollar alternative that I talked about was cutting out the worst areas, excavating down fifteen inches, putting in eleven inches of good gravel and then four inches of pavement on top. Well, can so we do... Those patches should last. Right, right. Long no, that, after right. The no rest that's of the road not what I was worried about. I was talking about the $20,000 fix. Okay. That, that's that, that's yeah. the one that no, I we just... Don't. You know, if we put the millings in there and, you know, they're not going to hold up. Um, with that, do, can we, like, maybe even fudge a little bit more? I, I know when they reclaim... Um, that stuff really packs tight. Uh, you know, c did we do any borings or, or any kind of test to see what we have there just in case we don't have to maybe? You know, we don't need to make this road last 25 years, but we need to make it last three or four. That That's really, I mean, I, I don't think we need to put 11 inches of base, yeah. but, you know, get that loose stuff up that's there and probably even... Cut the road, take the black top off that's all spalding, and replacing it's going to be a lot better than just going over the top of it. Um, we we certainly could uh, do some test pits or some borings to try to figure out what's under the road. That would, you know, obviously take some time, and it would depend well, uh, your what, timetable, how what, urgent this what is. What if we just cut the road where it's bad? Peel the stuff up that's just totally deteriorating, regrade it, and put some, you know, even we put some binder on there for now. Just something with some nice big stone that, that should hold up. Uh, at least that's going to probably buy us more than one winner. Uh, that's, any, you know, that's anyone's guess. I. If the material underneath there is organic and poorly drained, like I suspect it is, I'm not sure a couple inches of binder are going to are going <laughs> to. I, I guess we got so many holes, we just take a shovel and see what's there. <laughs> but yeah. that that you know, I just want to do something that that's going to last more than you know the the summer season and at least get us a couple years to. It'd be a shame to throw twenty thousand dollars away knowing that. By spring, it's going to look the same as uh, it did this spring. Thank you. And just just for clarification, I think what I heard was the twenty thousand dollar option really isn't. You looked at it, but it's not what you're recommending. Correct. You're, I, if I'm not mistaken, you're right. recommending the number three option. Yes. Okay. I would like to see if we can do maybe like a four, something <laughs> even a little bit cheaper, but that will will hold up at least a couple of years. But I mean. The number one option, the $20,000 one, ain't going to work at all. At least I don't think so. Thanks, Joey. Red? Well, I can echo some of his, but I'll tell you one thing. That old road before it was paved was in better condition than it is now. <laughs> when you consider what went over, it was a hell of a lot better. I don't remember whether it's gravel or not, but I do remember it before it was paved. But your third option is probably the best. I didn't want to disagree with Joey, but I've been down there at least twice. My son's taken me down. I called Matt, and I'm sure Matt has called you people. And some of the areas there, if you have a motorcycle come down there in the darkness and hits one of those holes, you're going to be responsible for a fatal because we're more or less putting you on notice as public works that there's a major problem down there. Now, I know what you put into it. I know what you're on the culverts. I looked at all the drain. In fact, uh, my son even got out and said, you want to take pictures of this for him? I said, no, they can come down and look themselves. But I'll agree with Joey on one thing. We need signs. We need to limit our liability down there. 
how much they will do it, but at least we'll have a sign there. There's several places. I don't re recall off top, but I gave the number of one house. I think it was 57. I'm not sure. It was terrible right out there. And on the corner where you're going to do the culverts, at least we're going to do them. But, we, Joey, I think we should go to whole 115. It's that bad. And... Uh, do as much of it as we can. Really, I'd like to do the whole road, but what we what we need is we need something right now. It's it's terrible. It's drainage uh, problems. Uh, there's holes in there. When I called first, you went in and you did some patches. When I went down, the next thing, and was about four days later, some of your patches were already getting thrown out. So. Well, let's not waste a lot of money and everything. Let's go and, and do this and get it done as soon as possible. Thanks, Red. Ed? Yeah, the qu I guess, I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> Can we grind up all that blacktop, reuse it? And I'm just thinking of my military days and use and make it look like uh, a graveled road, basically, and tar over the top of it or make it so somewhat hard. In other words, reclaim or whatever you do, to just get all that blacktop up, reuse it, put it down, and then put, I don't know, black tar over the top of it and use it as like a tank trail or put or put uh, gravel down and use it as a gravel road. What are we looking at, two years before we're doing it? Plus, we're going to work there on culverts this coming year, correct? Yes. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm not in your business, but you, you know what I'm getting at? <clears throat> just make it a gravel road. Well, that's what I want. Turn it over. Turn it over and just... And leave it. And repave it. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, I don't know. They can add calcium. They can add all kinds of other stuff there to try to make it better. They yeah, but it, but it won't last. It well, it's not it, going it to last. last. We know that. It and only needs to last. But can we get two years? All you're going to be doing is spending all. money now for something that's really <laughs> temporary. It won't last another winter to do that. But if they go on this, this other one, it'll last a couple of years. All right. I have a question. I mean, are we really supposed to be determining what we're doing with Mullen Road, or are we leaving it up to the DPW subcommittee? I mean, we, we can debate road base back and forth, but I don't think that's what they're here for. I mean, everyone needs to be able to speak, but I, we didn't, I didn't know they were making a presentation tonight that wasn't discussed in leadership, so no one knew that we were having a public works discussion tonight. So what is the goal for this session before it goes for three hours on Mullen Road? Well, based upon our discussion at DPW subcommittee, you know, they, they asked staff to come back to council with what the, the options were and making a recommendation what they believe, based upon their experience and knowledge, the best option, most cost-effective option is. And again, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of great ways to go about this, but, but in the end, if, if you want to hold people accountable for what gets done, they have to be the ones that, that say this is what we're going to do. And, and I think what we're looking for, it, what we'd be looking for is the recommendation is to do the third option, which they believe will take care of the immediate, you know, as quickly as possible, the immediate issue. Okay. I mean, that, that's good because yeah. I'm, but Sorry, Billy, but you didn't say, you, here's the three options, pick one. So I'm kind of lost as to where the conversation was, I was going. I trying to shape it. If you give so, three options, I pick them. Okay. So he's done because he's gone. So, Tom, you're next. <laughs> yeah, and on that, with the third option, and the, I think the, the huge problem on that road is truck traffic. And, and we, we seem to treat this road like it's a, a residential throughway. And it's not. You've got a lumber company up there, you got a mulch company, and you got a rubbish company. And I've seen the trucks up and down this road, and if you don't fix it right, it's going to get it just pounded to dust in no time at all. And we got to consider, and I'm sure you already did, that's why you're going with three, is the truck traffic on that, on that road. And up to track the trailers. Thank you. 
All right. Any other conversations on their recommendation of option three? Consensus? <laughs> okay. Next item. To the point. Uh, Lay out the expectation ahead of time. Circle, I believe. Is that on your list? Uh, the paving preservation yes. Right. <coughs> yep. Okay. So this is, yeah, the last meeting you asked about the pavement yep. preservation. <coughs> All right. Yeah, I kind of prepared some um, remarks about the pavement preservation program. I'll try to keep it as short as I can. Uh, but I think some background is necessary for not so much for you, but for the public to understand what's going on out there. Um, so here we go. La last year, we undertook a $6 million road maintenance project with roads 2010 funding that included patching, crack sealing, um, mill and overlay, thin overlays, and microsurfacing. Um, these treatments are not, were not intended to make the road come out in a like new condition. They're, but they're part of a strategy to extend the life of the roads and put off that expensive reconstruction that we talked about at $300 a linear foot. So tonight I just want to focus on the thin overlays and the microsurfacing now that they've been through a winter and a number of questions have arisen about them. Um, so the background is that since the town first undertook its first uh, road program in 2000, uh, it, the emphasis has been almost entirely on reconstruction with a little bit of uh, mill and overlay, I think, done along the way. And as a result, little or no maintenance and rehabilitation ha has been done on, those, on roads for many years. So we came back a couple of years ago in a series of presentations uh, to the council and the DPW subcommittee um, to recommend that a portion of the road's 2010 funding be um, allocated to road maintenance, trying to keep uh, roads that were in good condition in good condition so they wouldn't have to be reconstructed. And we talked about the pavement management principles. I showed you that nice curve, the deterioration curve that my colleagues sarcastically refer to as the Billy curve. <laughs> um, and we talked about the ways to spend money the most effective way, um, the right treatment at the, on the right road at the right time, the biggest bang for the buck, and so forth. And then we explained the various problems that develop over time, the cracking, the rutting, the uh, utility cuts, the potholes, et cetera. And um, we discussed PCI and how, and how we, we do a complete um, rating of the roads approximately every five years. And then we recommended that we be allowed to use some money to preserve the condition of good roads so that we would not have to redo them. And then last summer and last fall, the work was done. And, uh, and previously, we were here to address complaints about joints and manhole heights and so forth. But tonight, um, well, questions are persisting, apparently, about the microsurfacing. And, and since the winter that we had, the wonderful cold winter we had, uh, caused some cracking in the in the thin overlay roads there's questions about that so two weeks ago we went out and we re-inspected the roads that were micro surfaced last summer and we found that there's what we call reflective cracking and that is just simply cracks in the underlying pavement which were effectively filled with this treatment but cracks that that occur that exist in the underlying pavement just propagating up through the new surface and if you go out there it's obvious where the cracks in were in the old road this is completely normal and and expected and doesn't compromise the integrity of what we did um, we had an extremely cold winter 
uh, with nine days in February that were below zero and the pavement underneath the treatment um, as a result contracts. It expands in the summer and contracts in the winter. And um, the, so, the cr so the cracks reflected up through the surface. But the cracks in the underlying pavement, pavement were sealed by the microsurfacing and as a result water uh, can't get underneath the pavement and cause further damage to the road. Uh, going forward, when the cracks uh, in the microsurfacing get to the point where they exceed 3 16 of an inch in width, we, we, we will plan to go out and crack seal them. In addition, we found there's some loose stone still out there that, that needs to be swept up and will be swept up as part of the uh, spring sweeping program. And we also found places where the the treatment had been gouged by snow plows, which, again, is something that can't be avoided and doesn't affect the performance of the, of the microsurfacing. And frankly, you find that even in brand new asphalt roads. And then, um, so then next I would talk about the thin overlays. We know the roads, it's the South Road, Moody Road, some of the others. Um, it's important to know that in asphalt that's uh, produced in Connecticut, they all use what we call bind the same binder. And essentially it's the asphalt that goes into the mix. The, every mix that every town and the state uses is and contains the same binder. And it's designed to perform well um, under a wide range of temperatures up to 147 degrees Fahrenheit and down to a low of minus 8 degrees Fahrenheit. We had, th we had three days in February alone that were lower, that we had lower temperatures than minus 8. Under those conditions, a thin overlay can sometimes crack overnight, a brand new thin overlay. Again, this is something that's expected, it's normal, and the pavement underneath was crack sealed prior to placement of the overlay, so we, we expect the, the, um, the thin overlay to perform as, as designed and as we expected. Um, and just to summarize, uh, the 2014 Pavement Preservation Program was part of a long-term strategy to prolong the life of roads that were in good condition to begin with and not restore them to a like new condition. There, uh, both the microsurface uh, roads and the thin overlays are performing as expected. We expect the microsurface roads to add about five to seven years of life to the roads that it was applied to and the thin overlays to extend the life of those roads by 10 to 12 years. Questions? Comments? Questions? Joey? I, I got a question. Uh, the roads they did in summers seem to hold up a little bit better. Are they using the same product or is it just luck? Are you gonna, uh, I'm afraid I'm not that familiar with the roads that you're referring to except for Shaker Road, which is what becomes Summers Road when it crosses the town line. Well, I'm sure they use the same they product. Used a, uh, I think a latex modified chip seal on that road. Right, I, that it, was chip sealed, and, and it had rubber in it. Uh, or I something. think so. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like that. Them roads seem to hold up a little bit better. Um, the you know the road, um, uh, and I believe it's Maple Street, coming off of Fletcher Road, and it turns into I believe Maple. That road, I mean, that was pretty beat up, and it really looks good still. I mean, I don't see a lot of the same problems we had with our roads with the microservice. So I was just didn't know if it was a different product and maybe we should look into it at least talk to the people on the different product because i think it held up better there than it did ours they didn't seem to crack as much a couple comments if i yeah, can please. uh just based on uh shaker road because it's the only one i'm familiar with if you look at it and i look at it a couple of times a day uh commuting back and forth to work um 
it's exhibiting a lot of the same issues as the microsurface roads. In fact, uh, stripping of the aggregate from the surface from the surface by the plows is even worse. Is it? Is much worse. There's large areas where the aggregate is stripped off, uh, and in a couple places it's cracking. But <laughs> when you talk about chip seal, and as you know, I've said in the past that in prior jobs I've uh, used chip seal. I get very gun shy about it here in Enfield after having seen a reaction to the microsurfacing. If people on Circle Drive and others thought that the road was too rough, uh, so wait until, they, wait until they get a chip seal. It'd be twice as rough. Well, it, thank you. And, and maintain that roughness. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Questions on microsurfing, surfacing, and overlay? Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. So the, I, the fact that we've been doing, or that there was that much of a commitment in the last program year on the maintenance side, how, is, how are we continuing that? Is there a, a percentage of what we're doing in the next five-year cycle that will keep that up, or is it now becoming kind of a part of the operational budget of, of highway? Do you want to answer? Yeah, we, we yeah, we're debating over here because we don't have a really good answer right now. Uh, certainly, I can tell you that on the roads 2015 list, there are arterials that are going to receive similar treatments with, with crack sealing, thin milling overlay, and okay. so forth. Good. Uh, the local road list, I'm not as familiar with. Local roads is only uh, total reconstruction. Okay. In terms of going forward, I know there's a little bit of money. Well, it's little to me. I guess it's three or four hundred thousand dollars set aside in the capital account, and I'd like to see us have an uh, annual or or semi-annual um, crack sealing program mm -hmm. at least to try to try to maintain some of those roads that were paved seven, eight years ago. Right either brand new or overlaid so that we get those cracks sealed and keep the water out. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Anyone else? So I have a question on Circle. So you folks went out <coughs> and you inspected Circle. And, and based on your professional opinion, you think that was a, a, a good job and up to, up to specifications? <coughs> Short answer is yes. Okay. So so the residents that have concerns out there, is there an opportunity, um, if they so choose, to have a, a sit-down meeting with you so you can go over the benefits of microsurface? Because you got a street that's not happy. I mean, it's, it's not just one person. And I think you, I don't think Public Works has done the sell job that they need to do to the public for a new type of road treatment. <laughs> and and it might just be public information, but when you have one street that's next to it that gets a thin overlay, and they see that, I think it got a thin overlay. It got an overlay. An it? overlay, <clears throat> and then and then and then there's microsurfacing, and they hate the treatment on the road. You still have to you have to answer to them because mm -hmm. we can't because we're laymen. You guys are the experts. So at least I can offer that out to them to say, hey, if you have continued questions, let's, you know, find a convenient time so they can meet with you out there, ask the questions, and okay. Yeah, just direct them to my office, and we yes. can get it set up. Yeah, perfect. Go ahead, Ed. Speaking of Circle Drive, I was over there the other day, and they were working, uh, I'm thinking, uh, the water pollution control was digging some of the manholes up over there. Was that do you, you, know, you were aware of that? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> there was the sewer covers. These were the original sewer covers that were on, but they were the wrong cover for the frame. So these covers actually sat down about a quarter to, to three eighths of an inch lower. So the bunk, so when you drive over it, you're, you're actually the wheel is actually going in lower into the cover, even though that the it's actually flush to the 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 frame is flush to the surface the cover is sitting a little lower so you're going to get that bump 
so when they were done, it may be hard to see in this picture, but the um, when they were done with the proper, with the right, with the correct cover, that's what they look like. Okay, so I haven't I haven't been back since they were there, but they did them all on that old yes, circle they did. drive. Yes. They all right. Did. Very good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on thin overlay microsurfacing? <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, still welcome. What's next? Anything else? Uh, there was a question about manhole covers. Oh yeah, your question. Oh my yeah, my question on the manhole covers were: Are we the places that we people are all complaining? South Road, Middle Road, Brainerd Road, uh, wherever we wherever we uh, overlaid and and all those manholes. I I'm still seeing cars and people dodging some of those manholes still are we gonna i know we fixed some of them are we going back to do them again right now we don't have plans to go back on those streets again that the manholes were within spec and we brought out that special um asphalt on a machine <laughs> infrared. infrared machine at great expense and corrected some of the others we corrected these manhole covers on circle drive so right now we don't have budgeted they're all within a state spec uh, we talked about whether that state spec wasn't um, adequate for the town of Enfield that's a you know interesting question uh, and so in the Buckhorn um, neighborhood the we're actually trying a different technique and uh, hopefully the manhole covers will be um, a little less uh, less of a gap than that you've seen recently and Donald's in charge of that project he can explain the details but we are trying to be proactive and address what appears to be you know some unusual concerns of residents in the town of Enfield compared to the state spec and trying to address that on the Buckhorn roads project with manhole specifically Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Carol. I had to comment because I, I know what Ed's thinking. I, I think when you say the state specs, I mean, we've never, we've done roads since we passed the first referendum. And these manhole covers that we're seeing are the worst we've ever seen. So I don't know if maybe we weren't following the state specs before um, I don't know what the answer to that is but when I hear you say you know maybe the state specs weren't you know right for Enfield whatever we did before worked so maybe we need to look back at what we did before thank you <laughs> Tom we need to budget for rings and tops when we do these roads and, and we have to have our men out there putting new rings and new tops on and not trying to you know use the stuff that we have and and that's the the magic of past years is we've had uh, our crews out there dropping a ring dropping a manhole cover and they're paving over it and it's it's brand new we're using old and new and we're going to get those bumps and and we got to make sure in the new <clears throat> the new one we're budgeting like heck for new rings and new manhole covers thanks anyone else Next item. I believe that covered everything. Any other questions for Public Works? Thank you, gentlemen. I will. I will just point out um, the town attorney's office had uh, put together the opinion on the Buckhorn drainage connections. I sent that out. Yeah. I think probably tonight's not the best time to to take that up in discussion. So I'd ask we talk about that at the next meeting. Okay. Give everybody right. time to reread it. Anything else for you, Matt? Nope. Any questions for Matt? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it did? Thank you. Next town attorney report and communications. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, you just took my thunder took with your, that last. Stole your thunder. <laughs> Um, I did want to give uh, one of the issues that came up last week, our last meeting was on the casino gambling north of, it was reported out of planning and development today, so it's continuing its way through. The draft, or the, the bill is presently drafted, includes uh, 
an approval by the town's legislative body for any town in which it wants to go into, it, it doesn't address whether or not it's subject to any zoning regulations in those towns. Um, and so it's still in the process. The chairman of the Planning and Development Committee indicated that she wanted to strengthen the municipal uh, role in that process, but obviously the, uh, it's subject to amendment throughout the rest of this process. So it's, it's, it's still alive and it's gone now through two committees, public safety and now planning and development. So um, it appears to have some legs, as they say up there, uh, to keep going through. So um, that's just a, a, we had that brief discussion last week uh, on that. So um, that bears watching as we go through on this. So. Um, okay. Questions for Kevin? Ed? In our, I'm not sure, maybe this is for Matt and not you, but in our zoning regulations, do we do require, we, we have a, a regulation that says we uh, allow uh, casinos or gambling? Uh, we have what is called permissive uh, zoning, which most towns have, which it has, something has to be permitted <coughs> within our zoning regs, otherwise it's, per, it's excluded or not permitted. Um, the problem with these types of legislative actions, the state legislature can override that at any time. Um, you know, as, as I said to Matt in one of the examples, you think of the ECS funding schedule, and then they adopt the budget and says, notwithstanding any other provision of the general statutes, this is what it is. And so depending on how this bill comes through the legislature, they can easily write one that says, you know, the Department of Consumer Protection has the right to issue these licenses, and therefore it's a legal business, and they can go anywhere they want. So it, it, I haven't looked at it in that level of detail. Matt just asked me earlier this afternoon about that. We'll take a look at it. Ultimately, it's up to the Planning Zoning Commission to both interpret its regs and to amend them if they feel necessary. Um, but again, the legislature can override that at any time uh, if they want to put those things together. Sort of like the siting council with some of the uh, <coughs> facilities that they've got or location of state facilities and things like that. And just to let you know, staff earlier today looked through the zoning code, and there's nothing in there that says casinos or gambling parlors or any of the things that you would normally expect to see within the code that, that would, would qualify as a casino. But uh, the conversation I had with uh, uh, the town attorney on that is, you know, one, to verify that, have his, you know, staff uh, attorneys go back, go through that to make sure that we didn't miss anything. But the second thing is that, that the Planning and Zoning Commission can <laughs> define their terms any way that they wish. So even though it doesn't say that specifically in there, they can, you know, it, you know do a text change. They can change, you know, say this is what that definition really means. So they have the authority to do that, even though it doesn't say casino or gambling parlor or anything like that. You may, you may recall we had that mouse pad business that got busted. That got shut down not on a zoning violation, but on a violation of the uh, state gambling regs on that. It was so within our zoning regs, it was a, quote, business in a, operating in a business zone. So it wasn't a violation of that, but it was a violation, at least the charges were, uh, with regard to the state gambling uh, laws. So. Well, I'm asking a question because one of the things, I, I'm not saying I'm in favor, yes or no, of a casino or any gambling here, but one of the things that really bo what bothered me is when I read it, read in the paper that there were comments made that we didn't want casinos here. And, you know, here I sit on a council and nobody asked me or we didn't have a di even di a discussion about whether we were, we were in favor of them like Windsor was or against or like Windsor was or whatever. And I just thought that, you know, we need to, maybe we need to put something together that we can discuss this. That's all. And, and that's what's on the agenda on this the agenda. week okay. is that discussion as we discussed at the last meeting. But let me, let me just address that because, you know, when it first came up, I must have spoken to about four or five different media sources. And, and I know that my staff member said exactly what I said to them which is that, you know, that's not necessarily the best form of, I'm paraphrasing, the best form of economic development, but we don't have anything in front of us. How can we evaluate that? But if it's a venue, if it's not just a box with slots in it, you know, that means a lot more to a community because there are other things other than just gambling happening. So I think it's something that has to be weighed. But again, you know, I know that that staff member 
said the same thing that I said. But, you know, unfortunately for that staff member, they were doing their editorial that, that week and not when I had spoken or it had been my name there. Because, you know, again, knowing that council hasn't spoken on it, I also know that, that there are strong feelings that we want good development within the town of Enfield. And Absolutely. a good development is, is one that fits within the plan of conservation and development which again you don't have that there um and one that makes sense for the community and so i think that's an important you know aspect to remember as we look at this that that you know we we speak unfortunately to the press all the time and again depending upon how you ask the question and how you put the answer in the story changes what we say well I, that, that's what my concern was i mean if this is if it could be a different menu than a box it would be it might be a nice idea or economically develop something. Thank you. That's all. Cindy? <clears throat> Thank you. I <clears throat> know we are going to have a healthy discussion shortly on this issue, so I won't express my opinions, but to our town attorney, Kevin, would you just clarify for me the override of the state? Because our zone regulations state commercial recreation includes amusement machine establishments, off-track betting parlors, shops, theaters, horse, dog racing, highlight facilities, bowling alleys. It does not specifically state casinos, nor does it exclude casinos. So if I'm understanding what you're telling us regarding the interpretation of the state statute or state empowerment, state rulings, they can, in fact, override whatever our current standing regs say. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, you think about it, 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 we went through the same sort of process with regard to the siting of cell towers, <coughs> the zoning reg, and then they pulled it away from the municipalities and put it under what is now Pura, you know, for state okay. siting. So although there's informational sessions and things like that, the ultimate siting decision is made by the siting council or whoever they're called now. <coughs> so the state can, if it wants, the legislature can act in a way and write the bill in a way that says, you know, the, the Commissioner shall issue three licenses, up to three licenses, uh, and you know may place you know, at suitable sites and not subject to local zoning. They can write it that way and take away the zoning power. Right now, the way the draft bill is written, it says it's subject to the vote of the legislative body of the host town, um, but it doesn't mention anywhere in the draft bill whether or not that's subject to the zoning regs or if it's just to be treated as another type of business. So. I suspect it's going to go through some additional amendments on that, but um, I don't think uh, any town would be would uh, would be wise to just rely on a zoning prohibition, because if the legislature decides it needs the money or wants these projects to go in, they're they're going to write it in a way that allows them to do that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Kevin? <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. We will move to reports of special committees of the council. Any update from the Enfield High School Renovation Building Committee? Jean and Donna, anything? Donna? I'm not going to talk for very long, but I'm, I did go to the walkthrough today, which was, I know I'm, I'm losing my voice. I might just turn that over to Councillor Lee, who was there to see the progress that we've made on the um, steam wing at Enfield High School. All right, I'll do that. Um, and actually, I <coughs> snapped a couple photos. Um, and if if ETV wants to bring those up, we can uh, show the audience and the council a couple quick snapshots of what's going on over there. Um, so that's what we are greeted to today. I'm sorry, staff, you can't see this, but it's, <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of mud um, on the site today. So they've actually suspended some of the outdoor trades uh, today and, and possibly again tomorrow. But nonetheless, um, what is happening is pretty amazing. Um, so if we click to the next slide, um, we'll start to see what's inside the steam wing. And this shot is looking down um, one of the upstairs, I think this is floor three. So you're starting to see the build out occur. Um, these corridors uh, you, will obviously contain lockers. They're larger than um, what the high schools have today. Um, and there's just a tremendous amount of utilities 
and um, um, HVAC equipment being uh, stuffed into these corridors. This is the upper level because there's actually not a lot of utilities installed yet, but, um, but they're coming rather quickly. Um, next slide, I think, shows um, the exterior of, of one of the uh, middle level classrooms um, looking out towards the Head Start building. There's um, the glazing and the uh, window work is scheduled to begin, I believe, the first uh, week of May. Um, if, you, if you look at the building, if you go down there this week or next, and you see any open area um, on this wing, that will be uh, fully um, glassed. I mean, so there's not, it's not that there's going to be windows installed here. That's going to be a full glass wall. Um, and there's a, a lot of that space on the building. Um, next photo. This is, this is the upper level. That's um, uh, Dr. Austin, who's one of the members of the committee. Um, they're just getting going. I, this is the top level, the third floor. Um, and you can see you're looking down the full length of, uh, of the Fermi wing there. And so this, this level holds a lot of the um, science labs on the uh, right-hand side of the photo. And I think that does it. Um, so incredible amount of work going on. Um, anywhere from 100, I'm sorry, 80 to 150 people um, on site for the next uh, um, several months. And um, they're going to extend an invite back to the council once they get into <laughs> the um, A wing, and uh, look at the uh, transition of at that at the same at some time in the future. So, uh, Gina, anything from the committee? No, I didn't go to the last meeting. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks for bringing that up. You're welcome. I think they're meeting <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> There's only so many meetings I can do. I hear you. <laughs> All set. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the updates. Any other reports from special committees of the council? All right. Old business, appointments, town council appointed, items 1 through 17. Is there a motion to remove item 10 from the table? By Deputy Mayor Lee, seconded by Councillor Hall, by a show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Item has been removed. One in opposition, um, Councillor Edgar. Um, is there a motion? Oh, um, I would make the motion to appoint uh, Raymond Bouchard to a term on the Clean Energy Committee through uh, March 17, 2018. Motion by Deputy Mayor Lee, seconded by Councillor Stokes. Is there a motion to close nominations? <coughs> motion to close nominations. By Councillor Mangini, seconded by Councillor Stokes. By a show of hands, all those in favor of closing nominations? Those opposed? Nominations are closed. Any discussion? <coughs> Sensing none, roll call, please. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Lee. Mr. Bouchard. Councillor Mangini. Ray Bouchard. Councillor Stokes. Mr. Bouchard. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Denny. Against. Councillor Edgar. Against. Councillor Hall. Four. And Mayor Copen. Raymond Bouchard. We have nine in favor, two against, no abstentions. Any other appointments by the council? Appointments by the town manager. And items C and D remain on the table. New business, all remains on the table. So we move to items for discussion. Um, the appointments will push to the next agenda. The only item that was not moved to miscellaneous is item I, resolution opposing legalized gambling facilities in Enfield. Discussion? Any comments? <laughs> We're <gonna start> it. <laughs> Go ahead, Joey. You know, I, I, I'm neither opposed or for this, but I think properly done, this could be a boom for Enfield. 
I mean, you know, you, you put this in the right place, and if they have other things that go along with it, I, I wouldn't be for just a box of one-armed bandits and, and tables, but if they did something a little different, I would, wouldn't be opposed to it either. So, you know, I think that we need to keep our minds open and uh, see what comes down, and if we do have to draft something, draft something that would protect us but not close the door. Okay. Greg? Um, I'm, I'm opposed to it. I mean, um, a couple of things I want to mention. You know, it, it, this is reactionary to what's going on in, in Springfield with the casino being built there. So they're, they're trying to hedge their uh, bets, as they say, to keep the money into uh, Connecticut. So anytime you have development that's reactionary, you need to be leery as a community what's coming in. Um, the other side of the coin there is that uh, uh, if this was a situation where somebody for a couple of years, not because something else is going on, but wanted to develop a, a nice uh, destination place with restaurants and shopping and those kind of things there, I think it's worthy of looking at, obviously. But my understanding this is going to be just a warehouse with slot machines. And what will happen is, and, and I'm being very careful how I say this, but there will be a, a group clientele that will head to Springfield. Uh, for that uh, destination, and there be there be a different group that would hang out in Enfield, because it's 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 easier. It might be a cheaper venue for them to get to, um, and I think to not have any type of uh, public safety analysis on it. I, it to me is a nightmare. Uh, I'm all for development. Uh, I enjoy going to Mohegan Sun. I enjoy going to those places there. But when I go there, I want it's, it's the total package. A great dinner. You walk around. You know, you watch people, which is probably the funnest part of it all. Um, but I have this great fear that they just want to, you know, they, they want to hedge their bets to make sure to keep some money in Connecticut. And I'm, I'm against it. So, And I want to mention, too, I had an email, and somebody asked me to say for the record they're against it, and that was Kelly Himmler. She asked to be on the record that she's against it also. So I'll do that for her. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Tom? All right. I'm not a fan of, of, of gambling at all. I, I, but then again, that's not my job to sit here and throw my morality out on this. I got to look at it at a standpoint towards what's good for Enfield. Now, there's already legalized gamble, gambling off track betting in Hartford and in Windsor Locks. And God bless both areas if they want to add them, go for it. That's all, that's a, the perfect area as far as I'm concerned because they're already into to, uh, gambling right now uh, from off track betting. The problem is, I hear the argument is 1,200 machines that are taxable. I hear jobs. I, I hear, you know, the argument, though, of the all-inclusive gambling casino really bothers me because when the problem with the casinos now is they want you to spend every dime of their money inside their casino and very little to the uh, community. With these kind of parlors, you're forced to use the community's restaurants, hotels, and uh, recreation. So I see the opposite there. But again, uh, I'm personally not in favor of them, but I think we have to keep somewhat of an open mind. If, if the casinos or the uh, people that run it would say, hey, we're going to give you 5% of the slots, you start doing the math. We all want our schools funded. We all want our roads paved. Uh, we have to at least give it serious thought um, uh, one step at a time. Um, I think we're, we're good to get out in front of this right now and, and to throw it around, find out about our, our uh, our uh, zoning laws that we they are right now. I know we have, you know, uh, bingo in town right now, and I'd hate to write laws that would restrict our our um, fundraising gambling. Um, so we have to be careful there too, without uh, you know just shooting from the hip too fast. But that's that's just my opinion, and uh, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. A um, <clears throat> couple of things. I don't want to wordsmith this resolution, but. I don't support this resolution at all. I, I think it's poorly um, prepared, first of all. I think that there's language in here that needs to be readdressed, okay? I think that we need to go back to the drawing board and um, work it out a little better. And I'd be happy to point out the specifics at some point in time to whomever's drafting it. <clears throat> Secondly, I do agree with Councilman Bosco. <clears throat> you know, um, there are two sides to this issue. Uh, again, you know, opening up a full-blown casino in Enfield is not my idea of a good thing for our town. However, first of all, we don't have an offer uh, proposed by the state or by anybody 
to us. We, we have nothing. Um, I think that also we need to have a community conversation welcoming <clears throat> input from the public and not just by email and not by telephone, not by me going to Stop and Shop or the package store, but by people actively being invited to a session. If you have an interest or a concern, please come and, and speak. I think that would be appropriate. And again, like you know what Tom said, the convenience gambling, again, I, I quoted the, the zoning regulation and questioned our town attorney. I think there are so many um, dangling parsibles here that we need to um, readdress what it is we're looking to do. We're looking to um, uh, prevent organized gambling. Okay, I understand that. But then again, we don't want to shut out the bingos either because those are um, healthy, fun uh, avenues in addition to the fundraising for some people. So I think we need to tread cautiously and keep our eyes open and look at the whole picture and not just bits and pieces of it. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Gina? Thank you. Um, I don't have a heck of a lot more to add. Um, I will say that I agree with Tom and I agree with Joey, but I love the casino. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not sure I'm excited about it being across the street from my office in Springfield or not. I'm not sure that's going to be a good thing or maybe it'll be a wonderful thing. I'm not sure. Um, but I do think that it's a good discussion, a starting point to have now because I really think we need to keep our options open and we really shouldn't just go down one road where we're absolutely against it right now or that we're absolutely for and we would embrace one now because I really think we need to get a better grip on what they would be proposing if they actually do propose anything to us and what the economic um, benefits or detriments would be and as far as um, you know crime anything like that so I would think that we should keep our options open and um, just have an open mind about it that's it thanks Gina red you're next well, <clears throat> most of what I wanted to say has been said but the first thing is and Cindy touched on it we don't have an offer Nobody's offering us anything in town. We don't know what we're voting for. We're just taking a carte blanche that we don't want it here. Now, Joy makes a good point. If you got the machines, you got a nice restaurant, you got entertainment, it's a different thing than we're looking at than just a plain box with machines in it. But right now we have no idea because nobody has proposed us anything. Now, Windsor voted against it. But Windsor Locks is not doing anything right now. And I think that we should go along with Windsor Locks and not do a thing on this right now. If anything, we should probably table this until a later date when we have a definite proposition. Ed? Yeah, well, I guess the qu one of the questions, um, I, I just don't want to arbitrarily vote no legalized gambling. If we do that, I, I guess the town attorney will, will address that. If we say no legalized gambling, does that mean we shut all our bingo down now? Uh, Legion, Legion and uh, church bingos and so forth, that's legalized gambling. And it, I mean, there's obviously a difference between those and casinos. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to pass a new law to allow the casinos in. Uh, so you could tailor it any way you'd like. Uh, or take no action whatsoever until you see what <clears throat> develops further down the pike. I mean, that's... Well, yeah, but I guess you didn't answer my question. I, the question I have is if you, if we vote on this no legal, opposed legalized gambling facilities in Enfield, does that mean we shut down our bingo that are, that are, that's going on now with the churches and organizations that run it? I would, I wouldn't consider the VFW an, or a, a Legalized gambling facility. I mean, it's a that's a facility. Dedicated so it's not a facility. Yeah, it's not for legalized gambling. Purposes. Well, anyway, I'm not I'm not in favor of the, uh, this at all. I'm not voting. Lord. Further discussion? Yeah. D just Bill. just so we're clear. I mean, the the purpose of asking this be on the agenda was was so that we could start a dialogue and and um, and I asked that we get a copy of the the Windsor resolution, perhaps for no other reason than just to see what was in it and how they were taking their approach. Um, I certainly wasn't expecting to have us prepared for a, a vote tonight, and I, I would c caution us from even attempting one, not knowing you know where the state is headed. Um, I think the Attorney General's report last week 
is a big pail of cold water on the whole pro process. Um, I think that, you know, as, as Cindy mentioned, and as I, I thought I was encouraging last week, um, that we do, you know, if we want to proceed with this conversation, that we do schedule a public hearing at some point or a, a community conversation once more of the facts are known. But, you know, the, the goal was to get out ahead of this. Um, we've been accused way too often for um, acting without opportunity for adequate public input and uh, starting this dialogue maybe a little bit early, maybe a little bit too early, um, was just one way to um, to make sure that we're starting to pay attention to what what they're considering in Hartford, with or without, you know, <laughs> valuing our input. Um, they're going to make a decision one way or the other, and at least if we're paying attention, then um, you know what do they say? Forewarned is whatever whatever they say. Yeah. Forearmed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carol. I think everybody said what needs to be said. I think I'm I'm with the more cautious uh, folks up here that want to just wait and see what comes forward. I, I think we're we're jumping ahead, and I appreciate the opportunity for discussion. But I think we also need to take our time and see what's what is offered to the town of Enfield. I I don't want to lead with a negative resolution. I I think that's the wrong message to send. I want to hear from the residents of the town to see if it's something that would be interesting to them. Um, and I don't want to close the doors on anything until we hear what the offer is first. So I think we're going down the right road, and I think we need to set up some public discussion and uh, open it up for input and uh, see what comes our way. And at that point, uh, obviously, planning and zoning will have the ultimate say and uh, it's really not a council discussion as far as I'm concerned. The final say goes to planning and zoning. We can have an opinion on it. Um, I'm not willing to give an opinion yet. I, I think it's too premature, so that's where I am. Further discussion? Will you take a motion to table? You don't need to. It will just push. Just All right. Um, Matt, just some of the questions that I sent you, I mean, what what do we have from the state of Connecticut in the legislation as to what was, what's the intent, the design? Um, do we have any of that information? Well, what, <clears throat> what their intent was, and, and I think it's captured pretty well in, in what was written, by the way, in Windsor, not by Enfield. It has changed Enfield, Windsor to Enfield here. But, um, is to try to capture the the flow of money out to the new casino in in uh, Springfield. Um, I, I guess I could go around in generalities with this, but specifically what what they're looking to do, I think, is yet to be unveiled. Because um, again, they're they're going through their committee process right now on the concept more so than what the actual language is. All right, because I didn't know if there was a concept behind. Can convenience gambling facilities but yeah they you know I, I I think by the time something gets adopted we're gonna have a better idea of what they're really talking about but again what yeah. what we're seeing what we're hearing not not necessarily what's been written in uh, the legislation they're trying to adopt is that's evolving is that that it's you know not a traditional large casino operation it's more in line with an off-track betting concept where it's you know a facility you you have certain gambling type of uh, uh of operations within that but again even within that um it would make sense that they probably have some type of food vending as well within that so again we don't know but it makes sense that that and it would also make sense that there'd probably be a liquor license that would go along with that facility but that's that's the stuff that's not you know in any of the codes that that go to that, and so it's going to come along if there is a proposal somewhere that you know this is what it is going to be this this and this it may come after the legislation, it may not be a part of the legislation. Okay, and then just my last comment: I was contacted by a resident last week, uh, spoke to him, he's been uh, contacted by Mohegan Sun. And uh, so I said, Enfield's always open and willing to listen. 
So told the gentleman to pass along Courtney's uh, name and number. And uh, if someone from Mohegan Sun wanted to reach out to Enfield, the first point of contact is Courtney. So, and that message was to be delivered um, sometime this week. So we'll see. Um, all right, any other discussion on this? So this item will just move to the next meeting. Um, that completes items for discussion. So we move to miscellaneous. Under miscellaneous, uh, the first item, discussion, resolution, request for transfer of funds for congregate living, $3,750. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfers hereby made. Two 0413 Congregate Living Salaries Part-Time, $3,750 from 0413 Congregate Living Food, $3,750. Certified the funds are available. Lynn Nenny, Director of Finance. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilor Mangini, seconded by Councilor Arnone. Discussion? Sensing none, roll call. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Stokes is out. Councillor Suzak? Four. Councillor Arnone? Four. Councillor Bosco? Four. Councillor Sakala? Four. Councillor Denny? Four. Councillor Edgar? Four. Councillor Hall? Four. Mayor Copen? Four. Council. Oh. Which one was it? Congregate, Congregate Living. Living? Four. Thank you. Yeah. We have 11 in favor, sure none against, no right abstentions. <laughs> He Only makes, if you get one, Councillor Stokes. <laughs> he makes too much already. All right. <laughs> I don't know if we allowed Suzanne to finish with the vote. You just, just said there was 11 in favor, none okay. against. Oh. No extensions. Thank you. Next item, discussion resolution, request for transfer of funds for EMS $70,000. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfers hereby made to EMS vehicles $70,000 from EMS other funds $70,000. Certified the funds are available. Lynn Nenny, <coughs> Director of Finance. So by Councillor Mangini, seconded by Councillor Hall. Hello, Gary. Good evening. Good evening. Do you have anything for us or just questions? I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions for Gary? That's well, okay. I don't mind if you don't have one. <laughs> What's the gas mile? Never mind. All right. Sensing no questions or comments. Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Stokes. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. <clears throat> With thanks to the John Macholik Post 154, this money basically depletes the, um, the ambulance fund account, correct? Correct. So this would be the final ambulance that those funds will cover. Indeed. So heartfelt thanks to them. Yes. Yeah. Decades and, uh, of work. And certainly, uh, I'll just say ETV appreciates this too because the... Uh, the last of the Ford ambulances will be repurposed to them. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, no. So, I'll have they a traveling need, studio. They need uh, something to carry their equipment. That's, That's cool. great. All right. Great. Thank you all very Thanks, much. Thanks, Gary. Have a good night. Next item, discussion resolution, <clears throat> request for transfer of funds for social services, 75401 Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfers hereby made to 4320 Child Development Center, certified salaries 5014 non-certified salaries 22232 health medical 3759 social security 1689 Medicare 395 instructional supplies 352 Salaries part time three thousand one ninety four. Salaries temporary seasonal seven thousand. Overtime five thousand. <clears throat> Other professional services three thousand seven ninety. Two four zero zero one. Social services administration salaries eleven thousand four eighty eight. Other professional services two seven three eight. Printing one thousand five hundred. Food two fifty. Furniture seven thousand dollars. 
from 4320 Child Development Center School Readiness Grant 44,929, School Readiness Enhancement Grant 3,790, and Child Day Care State Grant 15,194, and 4,001 Social Service Administration Salaries 11,488. Certified the funds are available. Lynn Nenny, Director of Finance. So by Councillor Mangini. Second. Second by Councillor Stokes. Discussion? Sensing none, roll call please. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Stokes. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Edgar. Four. Councillor Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. It's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Next item, resolution adopting complete streets policy and master plan. Whereas the town council is fully committed to bike and pedestrian safety for the town of Enfield, and whereas the town has developed a long-term plan for infrastructure improvements, including bike lanes, sidewalks, and multi-use trails, and whereas the town will consider the value of walking and bicycling from multiple perspectives, including public safety, public health, transportation for residents of all ages, and income levels, recreational needs of residents and their abilities, and connecting residential neighborhoods with commercial areas, schools, and services. <clears throat> and whereas the town will review and prioritize infrastructure improvements that facilitate safe and frequent walking and cycling routes while looking at the broader perspective of connecting local area towns. Now therefore be it resolved that the town council of the town of Enfield adopts the town of Enfield complete streets policy and master plan as attached. So moved. Second. <coughs> by Councillor Arnone, seconded by Councillor Mangini. So a couple months ago, the town council passed a resolution authorizing staff to put together a complete streets policy. Uh, we researched and basically took the number one complete streets policy in the nation, put the town of Enfield's name on it, edited it so that it referenced Connecticut st state law as opposed to the state that it came from. And all the policy is saying is that when we construct or look to construct streets or upgrade streets, we will take into account complete street policies or complete street priorities which may include uh, if it doesn't have a sidewalk and we think it should one, a design for a sidewalk, or if we think a shared lane should be on there for bicycles, that'll be on there, lighting. Um, this is basically just saying that when we look at a street, we will take into consideration complete streets ideas. That's all this policy says. And then we, writ we wrote into the policy that every five years, the town will review its complete streets plan which is the big roll of paper that you have in front of you. On that, you see that we've worked with the Roads 2015 program. So right now we're focusing on those roads because those are the ones that we're looking at constructing over the next five years. Um, this was just given to DPW subcommittee last week. We, we went over it and thought it'd be a good idea to bring forward to full council for review and discussion. All right. Questions, comments from the council? Just, just Councilor Anoni? Just a quick one. Phase four, how, is that in my lifetime? <laughs> that's, the exci that's the exciting one for me. I think that's the coolest. That's a, that's <laughs> a subjective It'll question be great and if answer. I can get on my bike. <laughs> Four is the uh, so uh, let Connecticut me, River. Yeah, let me, let me sort of guide you around the map a little bit. So the red areas are the schools, the green lines around there are all the sidewalks. One of the th good things that we're focusing on here with this Complete Streets policy is also a safe routes to school program and policy. So every red block that you see should have corresponding green lines around it, which means that that's how we're determining whether there's any gaps in sidewalks. So uh, kids and parents and others have uh, direct routes from in and around the school areas. So that's a, and surprisingly, when we looked at this, we found there was really only one small gap 
Uh, for the most part, we have very good sidewalks around, in terms of connectivity, uh, we have very good sidewalks around our school. So that's, that's what the green lines are around the red dots. Um, and then you'll see that there's yellow up and down Enfield Street and across on, uh, let's two, look, is that 190? What that's showing you is those are the state roads. And in order for the state roads to have shared lanes on them, the state will only restripe the roads uh, for bike lanes if the town has a complete streets plan and policy in place. Or otherwise, they don't feel like we're committed to it while we're asking them to do something. So by another benefit of adopting a complete streets policy and having a master plan, um, is that the state will then take into consideration our request for striping of state roads. Um, on top of that, it just takes into account, like I said before, the Roads 2015 program in terms of this master plan. And the way that the policy is written and the way that we would approach it is that the plan is simply a suggestion over the next couple of years while we're looking at roads and you know, can be modified at any time. Questions, right here. Right here. Greg. I want to point out because I'm looking at you. Have, you have the schools listed and churches and libraries. You're, you're missing one church, just so you know. Okay, I would be, I would know that though. So, so Post Office Road, uh, the American Baptist Church next to Stowe School. So. See, I helped. Thank. Very observant. That's what they say. Questions, comments. Questions, comments on complete streets? Sensing none, we'll go to roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. <clears throat> Councilor Stokes. Four. Councilor Suzanne. Four. Councilor Arnone. Four. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Denny. Four. Councilor Edgar. Four. Councilor Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. And in favor, and against, no abstentions. All right, next item, discussion resolution, adopting and authorizing the town manager to sign the memorandum of understanding regarding school safety and security initiatives jointly enacted by the Board of Education and the town of Enfield. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby adopt a memorandum of understanding regarding school safety and security initiatives jointly enacted by the Board of Education and the Town of Enfield, here and attached as item A between the Town of Enfield and Enfield Public Schools, and authorizes the town manager to execute the necessary documents to implement recommendations of the committee. So moved. Second. By Councillor Mangini, seconded by Councillor Stokes. Discussion. Do we have any presentation first? Yes. Okay. I went to, because there were a number of questions that I had received earlier. <clears throat> so let, let me start off with uh, trying to answer some of the questions that were asked. In a lot of the information, for the answers are in what's being handed out. Um, but prior to that, just to let you know that I did receive an email uh, earlier today from uh, Councillor Sakala, who uh, sent out a uh, survey that was no right. It was sent to you. I'm sorry. I, I was finishing that part. Yeah, um, it was sent to her by a group that had uh, collected, uh, at my count, approximately 85 signatures. And uh, I'll read what, what it says real quick. It says, we, the residents of Enfield, Connecticut, are requesting the Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, regarding school safety and security initiatives jointly enacted by the Board of Education in the town of Enfield, adopted March 25th, 2013, and effective till June 30th, 2015, to not be extended beyond June 30th, 2015. Again, there's uh, a number of signatures on this as well. So I don't know if you want to see this. I can pass this around if you're interested. Or I can make copies and send it to you, but approximately 85 residents signed it. Okay. Uh, send it down. So I received uh, a list of uh, questions, and uh, that's the, the two, 
the stapled piece, trying best to answer this. Um, first uh, question was projected budget fiscal year 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, that's on the second page of the handout, uh, top of the page, school security budget projections. And FY 2016 is what has been presented to council. And so 2017, 2018, and 2019, you haven't seen yet. Um, we start as part of the plan that you received as uh, the backup for this uh, resol resolution. Um, we start reducing the number of armed SSOs. And there's actually three unarmed SSOs added over this period. And uh, by 2019, we've reduced it down to effectively four, and, and I'm going to use this word loosely, uh, positions. What, what they really are, are are not, you know, individuals. We'd probably have, again, a pool of, uh, at, or of uh, SSOs that we would be able to pull from. Like, for instance, right now we have 21 SSOs, but we only have 15 stations. And so these in my mind, it would be more akin to the stations that we're doing, but they're going to be uh, roving around uh, to each of the different schools. Um, and so you'll see as we get closer, as we go to 2019, the uh, SSO program starts being reduced. Another part, another element of the plan that was a part of this was the increase in SROs, school resource officers. And so the first one increase in that going from three to five starts in 2017 and that's the uh, line just below where it says school security and it has the totals and you see that in 2018 we now have two additional so we're at the five that's part of the plan and then 2019 again is just the two but i've increased uh, those i think by five percent because of the benefit uh, piece of it as well where the inflation factor for the salaries for the part-time we're only at a 2% clip, and uh, since there's no benefits, you know, there's not a greater uh, increase with that. And so I don't know if you have any questions over that. I know this is the first time you've seen it, but it took a while to put this no, together. No, thanks, and, and uh, I appreciate this because this is exactly what I wanted to see tonight, um, and you did pretty much pretty good. I can, I can read it quick. I can, I can uh, absorb it, and uh, I'm not sure if we're in discussion on this yet. Yeah. Um, so, so what I see, and, and this is what was kind of bothering me about this agreement, was, uh, you know, we're, we're being asked to sign a, a two-year MOU, but there's four years worth of, of uh, a budget here. So when it comes to the second year, when this MOU comes back up again before the next council, nothing has really changed. And, and that's where I have a problem with right now, that I don't, I don't believe we're putting uh, uh, putting uh, you know some of the stuff up front where it should be in in reductions and uh, especially in year uh, 2016 it, it, in 17 we kind of get a bit of a spike because we add an SRO so it actually goes up before it starts to go down and and by the time 2019 comes around you know I, I, I who knows if I'll be here um, and but I know in two years another council or this similar council is going to be could blow the whole two years right out the window and change the whole thing again so i'm going to vote for a four-year uh, uh, package tonight that i only have control over two years of it so i i think it's it, it's a very difficult decision and it's it really makes my mind up tonight where i'm heading um because i have a really difficult time voting on something for two years that has four years and it only shows any reductions in the in the fourth uh, uh, a year um and the overtime costs too were very interesting and in, in what we're pay paying also with police overtime in this whole thing which which jacks it up but i appreciate this uh at such short notice and uh thank you for getting it out and, and oh, can, I, ahead, can i explain the logic behind why you don't start seeing things really starting to, to change until two years out um, as we looked at the way that we could reduce the footprint of the, the armed SSOs, we, we went back to where do we stand with the uh, uh, hardening of the buildings. And what, what we know is that there are certain uh, things that still need to be done, and they're listed as part of the backup for that. And the thought being that if we get the 
uh, referendum passed here in November for the school facilities uh, improvements that we're looking at, we'd be able to start those probably within a year of the passage of the uh, uh, referendum. And probably the first focus would be on JFK, and that's why you start seeing a change there. And you also see a change in the high schools because in 2016, starting 2016 school year, uh, we are now all, both high schools are merged into one. And so we have already two uh, uh, SROs there, and we transition the armed SSOs to unarmed. Um, plus, we have all the things that we're looking <coughs> to do with the school facilities improvement already in place. So we felt that we could reduce those down because of all those factors at the high schools. We then have JFK taken care of as you know, one of the first buildings uh, for the school uh, uh, security initiatives and facility improvements we need to do. And so we could then start reducing that down. And it really is probably not going to be until 2019 that we have the majority of the improvements made to the elementary schools. Now, the unknown of all this, again, is do we get a referendum passed or not? And the second, really, what is that, that uh, building improvement schedule really going to look like? And, and again, I can say that we would want to focus on JFK first, but it may be more cost effective and makes more sense to, you know, do a different school first or a group of schools first. So there's a lot of unknown and uncertainty in, in what we're talking about. And that's why it makes it difficult to say in the next two years that we can, you know, take affirmative action like what you're suggesting. Okay. So, that, you know, and that's another issue. Uh, another issue is a referendum and, and probably the speed of at which we should have been hardening our schools and, and that to me also could be, you know, I've heard we've done so much and yet we've done so little and, and that's what another issue that I have with this uh, whole whole thing. And, and one more couple of points and I'll, and I'll leave it because I'm sure everybody wants to have something. But this is, we've said that the BOE was going to get this first. And now we're getting it. It's, and now I want to hear from the committee because this isn't, didn't even come out of the committee. This came out of governance. Uh, um, uh, so I'm, I'm really confused. So if we can explain that too, why it's not coming out of the committee that worked so hard on this from the beginning and it's coming from a whole other committee. Well, you as, you as council decided that it should go through the governance and you, you know, appointed representatives to meet and discuss this. Mm -hmm. And the point of that was to put together what it would take to get an MOU adopted by both the council and the um, Board of Education. Okay, I'll let our uh, leadership speak to that then. Thank you. Is this discussion? Okay. We're discussing it? Yeah. You, yeah. Um, Carol? For me, I to answer part of Tom's question, um, I was told that the government's discussion and what they came up with was a jumping off point. Um, I never took that meeting to mean that that was going to be ultimately where the direction of this council was going to go. Um, for me, I was told by Matt and I had a discussion with several members on our side that this was a starting point and that it was going to come back to the security committee to discuss. So that's where I'm coming from on it. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and again, let me just say that there, there are a lot of details to be worked out in terms of what that looks like, what, what even this looks like, because even within, you know, as we, again, trying to project out five years or four years down the road what that, that footprint really needs to look like, you know, maybe it's not, you know, if, if ultimately you're going with the, the roving, called the roving SSOs, you know, maybe it's not four you need, maybe it's only three, and maybe it's five. I mean, there's still a lot of details that are going to have to be worked out with this. But again, this is based upon what was asked in the time frame that we had to put it together you know, what we felt reasonably could be done and could be expected as a blueprint. And, and I, Tom, I think to be, you know, by, by so we had the governance, we, we have a governance council, as you know, and so we 
but because of the dynamic of the council with the board being Republican led and the council being Republican led, there weren't Democrats sitting on governance. So we had one member of the council, one member of the board joined governance. To me, and I think this was Carol's point, is that sitting through all the public hearings, um, what came out uh, to me loud and clear from the public is, you know, what is the long-term plan? You know, where are we going to be two years from now, four years from now, five years, wh wherever? So from governance, that's what we asked staff to go back and, and give a vision. But I, I know for, for me tonight, I'm voting on the extension of an MOU or not. The, the backup is not part of the resolution. The backup is a vision of where staff feels we're going or we could go over the next five years. Because there's all these milestones that could say, you know what? It, a referendum that we're, the council may say, hey, we don't have the money to go out and do a referendum. Or the voters could say, no, we don't support spending the money um, for, you know, not only the hardening component, which is only a portion of it, but the much larger um, school facilities referendum. So it's kind of like it's milestoned or stepped that if one thing happens, then we would move to the next. If one thing happens, we, if it doesn't happen, then we don't move at all. So I know for me personally, my vote is whether we're extending the MOU for two years. And then, as Carol said, it goes back if it does pass and the board passes um, and we continue with the program, it goes back to school security to continue to do what they've done over the last two years. So, all right. Carol, are you set? Ed, and then Red. Well, I mean, if you're going to just make an MOU, then I have no problem with voting for an MOU for the time being, because we haven't really decided whether we're going to keep guards or not. But the plan to 2019, in my opinion, is it's there's no exit strategy to get rid of guards or to reduce dollars and people. It looks like to me that we reduce two people by 2019 or whatever, or three, and go with an unarmed, couple of unarmed people. So there's no exit strategy to this at all, in my opinion. And I thought we were going to go to a referendum, harden schools. <clears throat> and the more we harden, the more strategy we have to get rid of people. And we're not doing that. We're just, we're keeping adding, adding this. So if it's a two-year plan and you want to do that, I'm not, I'm not in favor of guards. I'm voting against them. Uh, everyone knows that publicly, but I'll vote for this two-year uh, MOU in the beginning because you know what my vote is. But there's no exit strategy. Harden schools, fix schools, fix town buildings, and no exit strategy. And we're, you know, and the cost will be keep going. Red. Well, I, <clears throat> I read this a little different than you did it. I read if we pass this, that we're putting guards in the schools for another two years, armed guards, and that's what it says. It's not a thing that's holding it up. It's tonight, the basic question is, are we going to have guards for another two years with armed, or aren't we? Now, if we vote yes, then we're, and it passes, they're gonna, we're going to have guards for another two years. Now, nothing personal at all, but Carol, I have asked for an ethics opinion as to whether you should be voting on this. And I would look for their opinion and abide by their opinion. And as I said, nothing personal. Cindy? Thank you. <clears throat> I've served on the um, School Safety Committee from its inception a few years back and sat on the MOU drafting a few years back. And the plan was to have it sunset or two-year period and keep coming back for review, which is what's in front of us right now. I think that <clears throat> we could debate to eternity language, options, issues, but that's not going to get us to 
a resolution or to our goal. Our goal is to, like Mayor Copen said, get on the referendum, the hardening of the schools, and hope that the uh, residents, the voters, come out and pass the referendum. And in addition to having our school security officers, the plan is well thought out, it's well implemented, and it's working nicely. Maybe I'm hearing from different people, but I hear from the parents, I hear from the faculty, I hear from um, the residents um, that they're pleased with what the town of Enfield has put forward. So I'm most definitely standing behind the program. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Cindy. Greg, and then. Just want to just say for the record that I'm supporting the, the, the resolution tonight, this one and the next one also when it deals with the parochial schools. Um, and I know we all have our different opinions, and I want to say, first of all, I appreciate everybody come out to the community conversations and forums and talked. Um, a lot of good ideas and stuff there. And one thing that, you know, we came away with the fact that we have to create a long-term vision, and that's what the, uh, the idea of having a referendum to do those things, and then we can go from there. I, I just want to address uh, on behalf of Mr. Edgar about um, Ms. Hall, Mrs. Hall, about, um, you know, as far as which you voted on this. I've been in the council uh, for, for two terms. Uh, I've served with Carol when I was on the board of ed. I've seen her abstain when things that directly affect her in her household because of her husband's position. And I've seen her vote on things where it doesn't. This, in my opinion, has nothing to do with anything that benefits her. Uh, the interesting thing is she has served this council well for the last two years on the committee, making decisions, meeting two or three times a, a month, and no one questioned her about her time and value to that. But until we get to a vote, now it's questioned. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks, Greg. Gina? Thanks. Um, the way I'm going to vote tonight isn't going to be a surprise to anybody, um, <laughs> considering one of the reasons I ran. Um, but the way I'm voting tonight isn't just for me and it's not just the way I feel it's for I'm, I'm the mouthpiece for the people who voted me in and the and the people who elected me so the way I'm voting is not just because it's the way I feel it's because it's the way that the people who voted me in feel as well um, I do like Tom have an issue with the the plan that has been laid out whether it's the final plan or whether it's going to be molded into something different um, but the fact remains it's a two-year MOU the next two years, the cost of this program is going up, not down. And really, your 7, 18 and 19 are completely arbitrary because it's only a two-year MOU. Um, I will say that after the four forums that we had in the public hearings that we had regarding the guards, um, some of those big issues were addressed in this plan because um, there were people out there saying they had no problem with um, the program at all and keep it as is. There were people who said they wanted SSOs that were unarmed. Um, other people said that if there was going to be a gun in a school, it better be a cop. That was me, by the way. Um, even though I don't support this at all. Um, that being said, I understand the work that went in this, um, but I still can't support it. I won't support it. Um, I don't believe that there should be guards in, in my children's school. And believe me, I have two kids in these schools. And, and I don't I don't want kids in my six my six year old school. I don't think they're necessary. I don't think we need them. And for those people who say, well, fine, let's have somebody check IDs. All right, you're gonna hire somebody for an unarmed guard for what fifteen dollars an hour to check IDs. I just I don't think it's necessary. Um, but you know we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so anyway, I, I'd be voting no. I'll be voting no on this one and the next one. Um, so you don't I don't have to speak on the next one probably, <laughs> just to get it all into one. Um, and I think that was it. Thanks, Gina. Joey? You know, the funny thing, some Cindy said, how people are going to her and they want them. It's funny because people go to, seem to gravi uh, gravitate to the people that more think like them. Me, <clears throat> I haven't had anyone come to me and say they wanted them. So I guess it's just how people gravitate to certain people. I, I was against it from day one. And I guess I'll be against it until I'm finally gone here, you know. So uh, this is a, a really tough, hard decision because it's really hard to say, no, we don't want guards in school because deep down inside your heart's saying, you know, it tears on you. But, 
you know, I, I got a granddaughter that'll be starting school soon. I have nieces and nephews that are in school. I don't want to see anyone hurt, but if someone wants to kill somebody, it's going to happen, and the guards aren't going to stop them. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll just take it some other venue and, and, and do it. So I will be voting no on the guards, but if it does pass tonight, the MOU, I will be voting yes for the public for the private school only because I wouldn't want to leave one section of our kids uh, absent or try to set them for a target. So, but that's how I'm going to be voting. I'll be voting no tonight. Okay. Thanks, Joey. Further comment, Councillor Hall. Um, just to address uh, Red's comment about ethics, um, as you know, Red, you have to be able to have a personal financial gain from a vote that you need to abstain from. Um, if I was voting based on, on time, um, I think I'd be voting no because uh, this, this addition of this program's added a lot more work for my husband personally. So I guess my gain would be to vote no. Um, <laughs> but uh, the program is, is, is such that um, I'll say he believes in it, I believe in it. I've, I think all of us up here that have put the hours in um, to make it the program it is, um, and it truly is a shining star, are very proud of it. So I, I will be voting for it. I have no financial gain, no financial benefit, my, hu my husband or myself. So I, I definitely will be voting yes. And I, I think it's sometimes we forget that part of educating our kids are also keeping our children safe. And that's the Board of Ed's purview. They get to decide all the educational part of what our kids receive, and they do a great job of, of it. But when we're given the opportunity to keep them safe as a town council, I, I look at that as a, as a privilege. It's coming out of our budget. It's money well spent. It's a small portion of what we spend on these kids educationally every year. And for me, it's an honor. And um, I think it's kind of interesting that we're voting on it on the anniversary of Columbine. So. I think we tend to forget when things aren't immediately in front of us, and I, I think it's our job not to. So I'll be supporting it. Thanks, Carol. Red? <coughs> I think I have to come back and address it, both to Carol and both to Mr. Stokes. I said nothing personal, but the question has been coming up as to whether that was correct and it was an ethics violation and I know it but I also wanted to clear the air and have a clean decision made by the ethics committee nobody has questioned your integrity nobody has questioned your votes in fact many times I've voted with you that's not the question here and you can twist it any way you want Greg but I said nothing personal Ed yeah, you're, you know, I just want to bring out a few things about security. Go to St. Martha's on recess, and you got one guard standing out in the woods there. Anybody come out of the woods, they can take care of any child. Go to Fermi High School, Enfield High, at the end of the day, and the kids are running out of the building, hell-bent for election, to get in their cars and get on the bus and whatever, and anybody standing out in that parking lot can do whatever they want. You, you go to a, a ball game or some kind of an activity at the schools, as soon as the bell rings, the guard leaves, and the extra activities that are going on in those schools, there is no security. There is no security at baseball g games uh, in the afternoon. So to me, it's a waste of dollars. Thank you. Gina? <clears throat> Sorry, I said I thought that was it, and I apparently lied. Um, just really quickly, even though I, I have said time and time again that I'm voting no, and, and that's where I stand, and that's where I started, this is still a difficult decision to make, because I do care about my children and everybody else's kids. Um, I mean, as a parent, you do anything you can to keep your kids safe. 
That being said, this isn't going to work to keep my kids safe. Um, I'm not going to keep them in a bubble in the house. Um, so I have to sleep at night, and I will, even though I'm voting no on this. Thanks, Gina. Anyone else? Then um, I'll just, I guess I'll throw in my two cents and maybe end the conversation. Um, I'm going to vote in favor of the MOU. <clears throat> I want to thank um, our staff and our school security committee joint council board of education that came together two years ago, very difficult time, and they put together the best program that they thought could address the security needs in Enfield schools. I don't think any one of them said that this was a program that was going to protect a, a child, a student, a, a administrator, teacher, uh, during every waking moment when they're on school property. Uh, that's an impossibility. Our police department can't protect everyone on every corner um, in every home. Um, so I don't look at it as establishing an unrealistic expectation for security. Um, they honed in to where they felt as professionals, where and what time during the day is, are the schools most vulnerable based on past practices. Um, if they felt that um, school security really had to be during the, the uh, before and after school out on the ball fields, I'm pretty sure their information would have told them to devise an entirely different program. But we, when we look at the shootings that have happened at schools, it's been during the school day, inside the school. And they devised the program that way. Um, as my earlier comments, you know, this is a two-year extension of the MOU. Folks have done a tremendous amount of work to get us to this point. We wanted this two-year, this review after two years. We wanted to hear from the public. You know, we acknowledged that two years ago we had to move fast um, and that possibly there wasn't enough public input or opportunities for public input. We held four or five sessions. I attended every single one, ran the meetings, heard. And, and then we opened up governance because we wanted to make sure, as we did two years ago, that this was a joint effort between both bodies and, and both political parties were represented. To me, what I heard, and, and no doubt about it, this community remains split on the issue. And I respect the opinions on, on both sides. And, and I don't fault anyone for having an opinion that's contrary to me. Because in the end, as Joey said, you got different constituencies. We're all here for different reasons, or we got here for different reasons. Um, and all of them are valid. So, you know, they're valid. Um, but we needed to review this. And we also know that although we've come so far, we have so long to go, the, the harder hardening uh, you know, if, if we're going to be upgrading our schools, we're going to be redoing doors, windows, roofs. Um, there's security components that can be combined inside, so it makes sense. But our charter requires a referendum. It's a big ticket. And, and really, where, where we've gotten to this point, the decisions could be made by an 11-member council through funding. Really, our next steps, it's going to have to be um, approved by voters if, if we're going to actually take the, the full hardening that people are saying is required in a school building. And the community is going to be able to weigh in. Um, but if I sit here today, I know where we are not where we want to be on the hardening component, and at least the experts are telling me that the SSO program provides the security that's needed in the school until we get to the point of full hardening. And I know that, you know, we got a vision. We had a five-year vision. It's, it's, but that vision can change. And I, I don't want to sell anyone saying that that vision that was put on paper by four members on, on, the, uh, on the governance with staff is, is the plan. It was just, what can you give us? Because that's what we heard at the community conversations. What can you give us? Where does this go? 
important milestones. MOU has to be adopted by the council and by the board. If the, if the council adopts it tonight, it moves forward to the board. If the board doesn't adopt it, we're back to square one. But if the board adopts it, the council's got to approve a referendum. If the council doesn't approve a referendum, we're back to square one. If the council approves a referendum, it goes to the voters. The voters are going to say yes or no. If the voters say no, we're back to square one. So th this is what we got out of that governance process is we got steps to make and we got a lot of hurdles to overcome, but we have to start. So, and I think by extending the MOU gets us started and then we all have a lot of work still to do, whoever's here, um, and a lot of decisions to be made. So anyone else? Sensing none, roll call please. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Stokes. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Against. Councillor Bosco. Against. Councillor Sakala. Against. Councillor Denny. Against. <coughs> Councillor Edgar. Against. Councillor Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. We have six in favor, five against, no abstentions. All right. Next item, discussion resolution, adopting and authorizing the town manager to sign the memorandum of understanding regarding school safety and security in cooperation with non-public schools located within the town of Enfield. <clears throat> Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby adopt the memorandum of understanding between the town of Enfield and the duly licensed by the state of Connecticut non-public schools, Enfield Montessori School, St. Bernard, Bernard School, and St. Martha School regarding school safety and security initiatives here to attach as attachment A. And be it further resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby authorize the town manager to execute the necessary documents to implement the provision of this agreement and to amend from time to time as necessary with approval of the town attorney. So moved. Moved, moved by second. Councillor Stokes, seconded by Councillor Hall. Discussion. Everyone said their piece? Discussion? Yeah, I think so. Then roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Lee. Four. Councillor Mangini. Four. Councillor Stokes. Four. Councillor Suzak. Four. Councillor Arnone. Against. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Against. Councillor Denny. Against. Councillor Edgar. Against. Councillor Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. We have seven in favor, four against, no abstentions. That completes miscellaneous. Next item on the agenda is public communications. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address the council? Anyone in the audience wishing to address the council? Sensing none, we'll move to councilor communications. Any councilor communications? Deputy Mayor Lee. Um, something I forgot to, uh, to mention uh, earlier, the, the Development Services Subcommittee is, um, is working on with staff to kind of craft a um, action plan kind of a rapid action plan and then a longer range plan to address some of the um, increasing uh, blight and, and property conditions that we're encountering around town, particularly when there are um, vacancies, foreclosures, or abandonments involved. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know that, that there is a, a few different steps that we're going to be meeting and discussing with staff very shortly. I think we're shooting for the first or second week in May and probably um, I hope we're going to attempt to meet monthly to uh, kind of craft that that plan. But um, I know there's a lot of residents who are getting increasingly more frustrated um, with with some vacancies and who are in very bad shape. And um, I know that we're close to understanding how we can move from the blight enforcement into a more permanent solution with some of these. So. I know I kind of left a few folks hanging with some comments on that recently, but um, hopefully in, in by mid-May we'll have a, a solid handle on where we're going from here. Thanks, Bill. Any other councilor communications? 
Sensing none, is there a motion to adjourn? By Councillor Hall, seconded by Councillor Stokes. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed, we are adjourned. Have a good night. <laughs>